Welcome to the regular open meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. This is Tuesday, June 4th. Meeting is called to order and Pledge of Allegiance, and I have the honor of leading it. Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Acknowledge the media. I see TV is here. And I see the, the, no, the globe is not here yet. Um, approval of the agenda. Okay, Beth, um, I wanted to say something to the folks at home on your television. The guide does say this is the United Board Meeting, but it is the GRF Board Meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, all those in favor, approval of the agenda. So, so moved. Approval of the minutes of the meeting of May 8th. Hearing nothing, I'll approve right there. Okay, report of the chair. First bullet on my list is Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in our community. I know it's coming up soon, it's not here just yet. Happy Father's Day to all in the community, to all the fathers on our staff, and to all the fathers on the village boards. And could we give them a big hand? Thank you. I need to share with you that I am so grateful to live in a community where there is such demonstration of kindness and such neighborliness. <laughs> kindness, many of our clubs in the village donate money to the foundation. Many, many of our clubs do that. Neighbors helping neighbors. Just an example of three large activities of large clubs raising money for their neighbors in the foundation. The Men's Golf Club, this, and that was just over Memorial Day weekend. And Sunshine is having a concert on Sunday night with all of the proceeds, all of the donations there will be donated to the foundation. And on June 29th, there's going to be a Golden Girl Dance Show and that is going to be donated to the foundation. Neighbors helping neighbors, and then just really caring about others. If you had an opportunity to participate in the Memorial Day celebration, I know that you will agree with me that that was really neighbors and caring for our veterans and, and honoring them. Coming up 4th of July, put it on your calendar. Come to Clubhouse 2, you'll see picnics and bands and neighbors just being visiting with one another, another neighborly type thing here in Laguna Woods. And also on the 4th of July, you're going to get a little surprise. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later when I talk about the Thrive Program. And then on a personal level, we're having the opportunity to live in a hotel as our House is being fixed up from the uh, slab leak. And I need to say that there are so many people that I see that are saying, how can we help? And they're so friendly. The staff has been so friendly and helpful. I am just so honored to be a part of this community. And then I walked in this morning and sitting here right in front of where I'm going to sit, Someone put a beautiful flower. I have no idea who it is. So anyway, that, those are my chair's remarks and just what a wonderful community Laguna Woods is and a, and a blessing to live here. Thank you. And next we have Dan Kenny, our VMS rep. I've multiplied. <laughs> Good morning. I hope everyone had a great weekend. 
Uh, you may remember my last presentation in April. I mentioned that Jeff and Siobhan do such a great job of, of letting you know how our uh, BMS has been doing that today I'm just going to highlight some of the things that our board has been up to as well as um, you may remember in my, our last presentation I brought s some co-workers and staff members to highlight what they do and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce some of the employees today who were recipients of the April 26 employee recognition event and so held in honor uh, for the great service they do to our village. I just have a couple of things to mention about the VMS board. Um, at our last meeting, we the last meeting of the board, we discussed uh, the successes of the Laguna Woods Village Strategic Plan Retreat that we was held in Clubhouse 4 and was attended by the presidents, vice presidents um, of the Mutual GRF and VMS, as well as the various department heads. The meeting was very productive and the results will serve as a guide and provide goals for the future of the village. In addition to a mission statement, the group identified a five-year vision statement and three-year goals. At the board's meeting, the VMS board's meeting of May the 15th, a decision was made to follow the lead of the mutuals and GRF and conduct monthly board meetings rather than twice monthly. During the first few years of VMS, it was critical to hold weekly meetings to deal with the many items needed for any new organization to put in place. Once, once the many basics of the organization were taken care of, the board switched, as you know, to twice a month meetings. And recently it's become clear to both the board and staff will benefit from the new once a month meetings. At this time, I would like to introduce the employees who, honor, who were honored at the Employee Recognition Award. Uh, it's a critical thing to, you know, we always talk about being employer of choice and things like that. And one of the things we can do is recognize the great people that we have working. Uh, first, from the IT department is Hank. Hank's right behind me. Hank is a broadband project coordinator and has been with the village off and on for a long, long time, most recently about 16 years. Because of Hank's expertise and his technical skill, he has saved GRF and the village thousands of dollars and is a true leader and mentor to the many professionals of broadband. Next is Gabby Espinosa. Gabby uh, represents human resources. Gabby is a human resource generalist who is extremely knowledgeable and handles benefits, 401ks, leave of absence, workman's comp. Like Hank, Gabby is a tremendous role model and a mentor to the HR team. I know many of you know Becky Jackson, who is a public relations specialist with the CEO's office and represents communications. Becky has a master's degree from Cal State Fullerton and has had held several positions in VMS since 2017 and has been part of the communication team now. It's easy to understand why so many department directors and the marketing and communication teams relies on her talents. The representative from re uh, resident services is Delphine Matthews. There's Delphine, who is a resident services administrative coordinator. Delphine has been with the village for a little bit over seven years and provides great organizational skills and is key to the department's budget preparation, event planning, and more. The honoree from financial services, Shervin Porjanski. I know I screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she tutored me like a couple of different times. Um, who is our contract administrator? Shervin is the recipient of many kudos from contractors because of her expertise and great personality. In addition, she consistently takes on additional tasks, much to the, the delight of her fellow co-workers. Last but not least are the representatives of the Custodial Department Work Center 935. A total of 17 members of Work Center 935 were identified and honored. 
The entire team consistently goes above and beyond their job descriptions to provide excellent customer service. Representing the team today are Hilberto Chagola and Philemon Flores. Um, Gilberto is a custodian foreman, Philemon is a custodian lead. You know, I'm going to take just a, a second, and it won't take long, just to go over the names of the other people in that department who received the award. Octavio Ayala, Jose Martinez Maceda, Juanita Contreras, Pablo Maldonado, Jorge Flores Albanel, Adrian Gutierrez, Carlos Guzman, Walter Jacobo, Emilio Manzo, Maria Melkor, Julio Moreno, Marcelo Rojas, Maria Manzo, Edgar Romero, and Jose Lopez. As you know, VMS has over 900 employees, and to be singled out for these awards is truly special. So please give a warm round of applause to these valued employees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. That, that was a wonderful ceremony when the, all of our employees were honored that day. Um, now it's time for our CEO report, Jeff Parker. Good morning, um, President and uh, members of the board. Um, I have a few items to give you an update, and then I'm going to um, shorten it a little bit today because I know we have a big topic to uh, that we're going to talk about later with regards to our broadband services. Um, so a couple things. Um, our um, Mobility and Vehicles Committee meeting, um, which is scheduled for Wednesday, June 5th, uh, just around the corner here, um, will be at the community center from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Um, at that meeting, our um, consultant that we um, um, have um, working with us with regards to our transportation, FAIR and PEERS, will pro be providing an update of their um, study that they've been working on and preliminary route recommendations that they have um, met with staff on and developed through this process. So I encourage anybody that has interest in that to come to the community center from 1.30 to 3 p.m. on June 5th to hear that presentation. Gates one and nine are closed. If um, you didn't already know that, um, they're expected to reopen by the end of June. Um, and then we move on to gates 4, 10, and 14. Um, we're going to take on all three of those in the next um, process. So we will be um, um, getting those gates prepared for the um, RFID retrofit uh, construction. And um, luckily, the weather's been good, so we've been moving pretty quick on those. So uh, we'll continue to do that, and Ernesto's group has done a great job on keeping it getting that back up to speed as far as the calendar is of what we were attempting to accomplish. Speaking of RFIDs, um, again, want to uh, reiterate um, that the RFID is not just so you can get in and out of the gates easy, although that's certainly uh, a great benefit. It is also a way in which we can enhance the village security system. This is having knowledge about who and who is entering and who isn't via this registration of having these vehicles. So I want to encourage, it's, it's been a great turnout. We, we are getting closer and closer to our, our goal of getting um, as many people um, signed up for it. So that's great. Again, it's $25 for the, IR, um, the RFID tag. Um, come here to, community, to the community center. Residence, resident services will assist you in getting that placed on your vehicle. Um, and it's it's going great. Every time we get a, a gate done, we can then get a pretty big group of people coming in um, because it just enhances that, that operation. So, uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was something that's already occurred, but I just wanted, um, because it is a, a GRF activity, is the Bocce Quartz um, carpet was updated. Um, so um, that hadn't occurred for about uh, since 2014, 2015. So we got the bocce courts at Clubhouse One completed. They're ready for play. Courts are open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily, light, lighted um, for night play. Um, bocce club plays on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays 
from 1.30 to 4 p.m. and in the, in the winter and from 5.30 to 8 p.m. in the summer. So if you're interested in that activity, please um, contact our Recreation Services and also you can contact the Bocce Club. Um, wanted to mention um, not just the RFD process, but any of our assessments. Uh, as you know, we've been working really hard through our IT department um, and Chuck's operation there to get the resident portal up. Um, you now can pay your assessments and, and view work orders online via the resident portal. Um, so we want to encourage all of our village residents to sign up for that usage and, and starting um, the more and more the um, activity that we get on there, the more and more we can expand the usage of the portal to provide better operations and better services to our community. A couple, um, couple other items I wanted to mention was our Disaster Preparedness Task Force hosts a CPR AED class Wednesday, June 5th at Clubhouse 7 from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, this is Disaster Preparedness Task Force will um, be giving um, training on, on both of the CPR and the AED. Uh, the attendees who wish to receive a CPR um, certification card can pay $25 by cash or check on the first day of the class, and classes, class attendees must RSVP by calling 949-268-2356. That's 949-268-2356. You can get registered so that if you want to go through that process uh, of getting certification, you can do that. Um, as you know, um, we put our big um, new air conditioning uh, units up on top of the roof here at the community center. That's why it's nice and cool in here. Um, and um, it's been a big help in, in certainly addressing that. But um, the next step is we will be now putting on our new cool roof on top now that the units are up there. That cool roof process is gonna be done this coming Saturday, June 8th, um, and that certainly will help. Um, it's a, it's a, by cool roof, it basically deflects heat, so it'll help our cooling system work more efficiently. Um, it won't close the operation. Um, we will have to address some of the parking on the, on the north side of the building, um, and so we will have some areas that will be um, cordoned off as far as um, providing access to the roof but the community center itself um, schedule for that, the building and other parking areas adjacent to the building will remain open for normal weekend activities. So still come here if you need to, um, or activities or the gym obviously to, to get access. Um, last but not least, and this, was, this is kind of an interesting one and, and I don't know how much um, word's been out there yet, but um, I think once, it, once it, get out, it gets out there, there'll be a lot of discussion. We're gonna have a town hall meeting um, put on by the Orange County Register of Voters on June 21st at the Clubhouse 5 at 10 a.m. to noon. Um, the, because of Senate Bill um, 450, um, which actually was passed in 2016, it now permits um, counties to go to a different type of balloting box. Um, so your, your polling places don't have to be so specific as they used to be. You can, they can be broader and they also can be open longer. It doesn't have to be just a Tuesday type of thing as it used to be. Um, so um, Orange County has now decided to move in that direction to roll that out. So they, um, because they know we have a very active voting community here and we have a number of polling places in the, in the past, um, they wanna come and dialogue about what that looks like, what that would mean and how we would implement that within the village. So again, that is Clubhouse 5, 10 a.m. to noon on Friday, June 21st. Um, and um, just wanted to mention one other thing, and that is um, we, we've been very successful at this and we wanna continue. We have a new reservation system with our bus excursions. It is done by a, basically a lottery system. You can submit um, your lottery card, I'll call it, um, into um, for that through recreation. Uh, but what I want to really mention was that, um, so you get two spots per um, application you can, uh, you can put in for four excursions up front. And the ones I wanted to mention that are upcoming is Angel Baseball game. Um, it's a, a one o'clock game comes Sunday, June 9th. The Sawdust Festival for Laguna Beach is um, 4 p.m. Wednesday, 
July 17th and Fashion Island Newport Beach trip Wednesday, August 7th. Um, all of those are done through a lottery, so recommend people get their lottery card into recreation and they um, will facilitate that. And that's all I have to report today. Thank you, Jeff. Open forum, three minutes per speaker. At this time, the speakers may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors of the Golden Ring Foundation. There is a maximum time limit of three minutes per speaker and a speaker may only address the board once during this period. The <clears throat> board reserves the right to limit the total amount of time allotted for the open forum. Thank you. And Cheryl, who do we have? Okay, our first speaker is Ed McGill. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. My name is Ed McGill, 23902C. 23906 on the <coughs> course three, uh, eighth hole. And I'm here today to try to get a clarification. Uh, I went to resident services and got conflicting answers as to if GRF has a fund for damage caused by golfers. Recently, we've had repeated damage caused by windows. And it seems that uh, there is no rule or isn't a written rule accordingly. And I need to find that out. I'm the building captain there, and uh, the two ladies that are affected by this came to me because they got conflicting answers, and I did too. So I need to find out if it's a GRF responsibility, if there are funds, is there a contingency fund, that was mentioned also, <clears throat> things of that nature. Or there is no fund, you're on your own. I need an answer. Thank you, Ed. Okay, our next speaker is Chris Collins. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chris Collins, 3306Q, and I'm here with another update on the work of the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village on behalf of residents experiencing temporary financial crisis. Topic today is falls, a major health problem with very high costs. You may know this, but I, thought, I found this pretty interesting. Uh, one in four Americans age 65 and over fall each year according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Further, every 11 seconds, an older adult is treated in an emergency room for a fall. Falls are the key cause of fatal injury and the most common cause of hospital admission among senior citizens. Costs related to fall, the falls are also very staggering. The experience here in Laguna Woods is, of course, no different. In a recent review of ambulance calls, to Saddleback Medical Center involving village residents during the past four months revealed this, that one in two were the result of a fall. So given the potential problems related to such falls, the foundation is partnering with Social Services Department and also with Memorial Care Saddleback Medical Center to implement a fall prevention program in the village this year. This will be a pilot program and it's designed to increase resident awareness of fall prevention and increase avail uh, the availability of fall prevention services. This pilot project will include four uh, class series comprised of six, or uh, excuse me, comprised of eight progressive classes. Each class focuses on different aspects of fall prevention, which include topics such as sit to stand instruction, dynamic standing exercises, and fall recovery. So for more information about this new program or continuing program to provide medical alerts for fall prone individuals with limited financial means, please contact social services at 949-597-4267 or the foundation at 949-268-2246 or 
the foundation at comline.com. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Cash Akrakar. Good morning, Cash. Good morning, everybody. I have two things here. First, I want to thank our excellent management team, especially CFO, for being so active, proactive on anything we ask or request. Second thing I would like to bring is when people want to put together a petition of some kind, we don't have any provision for what and how they can collect signatures. Is there any way we can help some of these groups that <clears throat> some of them have very good ideas? And I was wondering if GRF can look into maybe putting a bulletin board of some kind or maybe a place where you can, everybody can say, hey, here's a petition for signing for different things. Uh, I, I was kind of wondering if th that is a possibility. That's all I have to say. And thank you very much for everybody for volunteering your time and doing such a great service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Romano. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning. And thank, you, thank you all for your time and to listen to this continuing uh, issue. Um, unfortunately, I received a letter um, this month or this last month that said that I had created a disturbance over in the clubhouse and that uh, it was necessary to have the security respond. That, that didn't happen. And I'm very unhappy that I received this. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. Okay, this was this was a a uh, request for compliance um, and a courtesy notice. So I don't I don't think this is appropriate, and it didn't happen. And um, that it, even if it did, it impacts on our right to share our feelings and, and our beliefs. So I, I wanted to give you an update about um, what's going on with my uh, fight for the. TV to be returned into the drop-in lounge is that I did talk to Adult Protective Services personally and they said that it was uh, elder abuse in terms of isolation <coughs> and what they provided was uh, a list of attorneys for us. They said that we need to contact an attorney to follow up. Excuse me, Elizabeth, uh, what, who did you contact? Uh, Adult Protective Services. You said to, to contact them personally that I, I couldn't speak on behalf of anybody else. So I was speaking on behalf of myself that I, that I did call them, okay, so that I could make this my own battle here, okay. And they uh, said that, you know, the isolation that comes from <coughs> that impacts us is uh, something that fits into the elder abuse area. And they gave us a list. They said, our, my opportunity, now what I need to do next is, is to contact some attorneys, and they gave us uh, resources. So I, I just wanted to keep you guys updated on that and say that I am disappointed in um, receiving this letter um, with big Nick's signatures on it and having a file started on me. And then third, I, I would like for you to think about the impact on, on the health of the people that aren't able to get information about even what day it is. And now the, the TV over there doesn't even have, you know, a picture on it now. And, and this is very discounting to us. It makes us feel uh, very small, not, not uh, diminished, okay? A lot of anger and resentment, and I hope that you will reconsider what you're doing over there, and you know, prevent me from from going further. You know, this this shouldn't be necessary. So I thank you for your time. Okay, our next speaker is Mary Wall. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, all. Uh, the United Disciplinary Committee has requested that I appear on television and apologize to the staff. I sincerely apologize to all the staff whom I have offended. It was not my intention to offend anyone Please accept my apologies. I'm very concerned about the financials in this community. In the future, I will contact the board with my concerns. 
and not the staff. I am being fined $500 by the disciplinary committee. The $500 fine is a hardship for me as I'm on a limited income. It would be appreciated if the $500 fine could be waived. It was not my intention to offend anybody. I'm very sorry. Please accept my apologies. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mary. Okay, our next speak. Our next speaker is Corky Ellie. <coughs> Good morning, Corky. Morning. I'm here in a different manner altogether. I uh, picked up the uh, two, uh, 2019 business plan, which I always get every year, and I was really appalled <coughs> at reading about El Toro Water District has hooked on to our sewer system and our uh, water system and put meters on it without a vote of the people. This is ridiculous. All the property in Leisure World, which this is still Leisure World and it will be until it burns down or drops off in the ocean, and the people decide not to dump. And they cannot hook onto our water system without the homeowner's vote. All of the property in Leisure World is in the trust. And the beneficiaries of the trust are the homeowners, each one of them has a right to vote on these things. The people in this place, for years, have never even received an operational budget. They don't know what the total is. And they cannot tell from this book. Because this book only lists three of the mutual. Or, or Corky, three 15 of seconds, the, Corky, 15 seconds. Pardon me, is Fif it over? 15 seconds, now it's 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. But this is Leisure World, it always will be. El Toro Water District cannot hook on to anything. They don't own any property in here because they have never gotten the vote of the people. You can't sell the property in Leisure World Okay, our last speaker is Maxine McIntosh. Good morning, one and all. Um, I notice now on the TV that we're all getting this little message, you need to lease a digital device if you want to continue receiving the analog uh, TV guide. And you know, years ago, for many, many years, the Register published a TV guide just for the village. <laughs> Every week, it was really nice. Just our call letters uh, lined up with our numbers. And that stopped, but broadband saw to it that we continued with the TV guide available to us on the TV. Now it says people who thought they were through having an expense with all the changes with broadband have to put out more money to lease the device. And, and this will be a hardship for some people. 
But I'm finding out when I talk, well, anyhow, I'm finding out that um, many of the people are more concerned about the inconvenience than even the money. As people get older, they want life easier, not harder, less complicated, not more. And get for some of them, getting someone to take care of it, to pick it up, to hand it out, and, and so forth, is really a challenge. And I'm hoping now, with the budget season coming up, you'll look at the budget very carefully about any unnecessary expenses at all. You know, um, through the years, originally the facility fee was set at $1,500. And GRF, not this board, I want to repeat that, not this board, different boards increased that fee twice by thousands of dollars so that they wouldn't have to increase monthly assessments very much. That's a false message there, that it can always be kept that low. That shouldn't have been handled that way, in my humble opinion. But at any rate, that's a false message. And we need to send, you need to send out a survey. Find out what's going on among these people regarding all the amenities and so forth. I still don't hear very many people complain about the amenities they don't use. But when I talk to anybody about not charging people directly, personally, for this box, they're saying, well, why should we pay for what other people need? That's what shared cost is. That's what we're doing. I don't golf, but I don't complain about my assessment going for golfing, et cetera. We all share the cost. We must protect shared costs, or we're going to have an active group meet. And I've seen that happen three times since I've lived here. Active, vociferous groups, loud, sometimes a little bit, not, not quite, but bordering on dangerous, taking on a cause. We don't want to destroy shared costs. The assessments must go up. That's true. I hope you will consider cutting way down on the spending on PAC over at Clubhouse 3. That's not necessary. Keep it to necessity. Thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. So now, um, responses from board members. Pat. I'd just like to briefly respond to Cash. Uh, he was asking about petitions. Uh, when I was on the United Board, we had to deal with it several times, and it is pretty much spelled out in the bylaws. I believe you have to get three, three sorry, five percent of the people to sign an initial petition that you want to go out and petition. Anyway, look in the bylaws, and I think you'll find the guidelines there for it. Thank you. Thank you. Roy. Ray. Uh, regarding Mary Wall, Mary, you wanted to get that uh, money dropped. We have a payment system which takes care of challenges of this nature. That's been going on for a long time. If you can't afford to pay the $500, we do have that. Uh, secondarily, on Corky, on the water tour, uh, I don't know if Mr. Parker is going to say anything, but they supply water to us, and they have to have some reasonable way of determining if it's an overuse. They're not buying anything from us. They're putting in a control system that says, okay, if you're using 300 gallons of water, you're not supposed to, unless you're shaking your head. I have a letter that says I can use water extra because of a certain disabilities. Those things can be handled and taken care of. Thank you. I'm sure Mr. Parker may have something to say on that. Who's, anyone else? Bert. Yes, Bert. No. no, no response. Uh, Chris, you pointed out that this fall prevention program apparently is going to be for uh, people who cannot afford. I'm just wondering, there are people in this village, you know, who don't apply to the foundation, but I would think that the program of this nature should be made available to the entire community. Um, I'm a little confused. Uh, yeah, yeah. We don't usually respond, but this is a good question to clarify what this program is. The foundation, um, you know, is concerned with uh, partnering with social services for people that have this kind of need. Now, I've read in the Globe where there are various times there are programs on fall prevention. But we, we've been um, expanding the kinds of services that we 
you know, offer. And are the role of, of the foundation, totally the role of the foundation is to help those that are experiencing, you know, fin financial problems. But I, 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 don't, I don't know. I just actually, Beth, I wasn't at that meeting. I just received what Marcy had written about it. But, um, you know, like, like we're doing all this stuff with visual impairment and, and all of that. And so this was just a new thing for us to move into because we've never done this heretofore. I agree with you that fall prevention is great for all of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that that's what the idea was, that we start out with people that wouldn't be able to you know, afford the class and whatnot in need and having social services recommend and then it would be expanded and maybe a part of social services and not a part of us anymore. And yeah. I, it's just beginning, but that would be the direction that it would go. I, I would think that if you have these programs that are chargeable and somebody who cannot afford comes, okay, that we could check with social services or with the foundation to find out if these people have already applied. And then there's no reason I don't see why we then could not provide that same service at reduced rates. Yep. Why a separate program? No, it would be the same, but an extended thing. This is just the beginning of it, Bert. And trying to, trying to see under the mission of the foundation of helping people with an emergency need, under that to start this up, but that doesn't mean that it would then stop and that social services wouldn't be able to be to continue it and have folks be able to enjoy the class and pay for the class and if they had a need to and couldn't afford it that it would be paid for by the foundation. Well, it's just a big, this is, this yeah. is like our first foray into it and doing I it would, under the auspices of the mission. I would just hope that this, this turns out to be a single program, okay? With, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, okay. extension out. Uh, for cash. Uh, Thanks, I don't Chris. think I would recommend cash that this board or any board uh, support petitions. If you, I, I know that the clubs do petitions, and that's a good place for it if you want to handle it that way. But I would not recommend that the board in any way support petitions. Annette. Okay, this is for Ed McGill. This is concerning course three, the eighth hole. Um, what we can do is, uh, I don't know the answer to that, to be very honest. Um, I don't know what the policy is. And I'll have to look into that, We don't, you know, in terms of that. The other thing is we've got... I have an answer. Um, oh, there you go. I'm already covered. Go it looks like Jeff Parker knows what I don't. Thank you. I'll just add to that. Um, it, it is a case-by-case -case basis, and we'll have Dan Yost, our risk manager, reach out to Mr. McGill and, and address it. So, okay. Thank you. Pat. Yeah, I would just like to clarify something Bert just said. The directors never support the petitions. It is the members, the people, that bring in the petition right. to the directors. Thank you. Diane. I just wanted to make sure, um, I appreciate what Maxine had to say, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands that the money we spend on the Performing Arts Center comes out of our reserves. So it's not out of our operating fund. So the idea of, of, of how much we're charging for broadband um, or to operate the golf course, that's coming out of reserves. But the $5,000 transfer fee and the Performing Arts Center, um, that's actually reserves. Yeah, right. Okay. Any other hands here? Um, basically, Elizabeth um, Romano. Tim, would you come on up and address? Good morning, Madam President. Honorable Good morning, members. Tim. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Just want to address uh, a few comments that were made uh, during open forum here uh, today. First of all, when, when we talk about uh, member discipline, those are those are confidential matters, and so I, it's really not our place to speak about those. Um, I will recommend um, Ms. Romano to contact <coughs> compliance, and I will make sure that um, they also are aware of that and they can get a hold of her. Um, as for uh, Ms. Wall, that's a United Mutual uh, issue uh, to be dealt with with United Mutual, uh, mutual reference, that fine. But, but more importantly today, you know, anytime we, we receive concerns um, about a, a variety of issues, whether it be uh, resident health, uh, suicides, um, uh, member care, 
we take that very serious. Uh, we work with the CEO's office with with compliance, with social services. We use our resources, uh, board members, um, and, and I take that uh, by uh, letting you know that we contact the health care agency. We contact adult uh, protective services. Um, I've contacted the coroner's uh, division myself as well. So um, the, the actions that we have taken are in line with the law uh, in reference to any type of elder abuse. Um, I would say that some of the information that is being forwarded to you is inaccurate. Um, and um, I want you all to know that we are uh, making contact and uh, speaking to the appropriate authorities at the county levels. <coughs> that's all I have. Uh, thank you, Tim. I, I'd just like to reiterate that. So um, we are taking care of contacting the authorities, Adult Protective Services or whatnot, if there's ever any concern and checking to make sure if anyone is inaccurate in a statement, checking to make sure that we are not abusing any of our people. Right. Uh, Laguna Woods Village is, is not in jeopardy of uh, being charged with elder abuse. Let me make that clear. Can I ask? Joan. So if someone has a problem that we hear about, do we contact you yes. regarding possible elder abuse well absolutely if it's if it's an individual who we believe is a victim of elder abuse um, obviously uh, we can start with with security but of course that that's a crime and we will bring the sheriff's department in for individuals uh, who are the victims of elder abuse uh, whether it be financial or physical but that's on a case-by-case -case basis not a not a, a global uh, right. Village wide, right. but you'd call the proper authorities to investigate that. Is that correct? We do, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, we we work with the resident, the victim, the families as well. And um, again, we we have our contacts with Adult Protective Services. I reached out. Obviously, uh, Susan McInerney, our manager in social services, has contacts as well. Uh, so myself with the sheriff's department, with uh, county agencies. We're doing our checks. We're making sure we're doing things right here. Okay. Any other questions for Tim? Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Consent calendar. We have uh, committee appointments, subcommittee. Shall we? Do I have a motion, Pat? Yes. No, I would like to. Um, remove the GRF committee appointments update to another area so we can discuss it rather than just approve it. Okay, where is the logical place to put it? On um, E under new business, John? Unfinished. Okay, so we're gonna move it's A under consent to E. E under, wait, wait Joan's gonna tell us. Um, it's maybe it's unfinished. Oh, it's unfinished. So okay, so B under unfinished, she says. Okay. Anybody else? So, so not hearing anything else, we will accept the consent calendar, the B part, and move on to unfinished business, 12A. Entertain a motion to approve a resolution to amend the Luna, Laguna Woods Village vehicle traffic and parking rules for traffic school eligibility. This, is, this was a May initial notification and it's a 28 day notification for member review to comply with civil code 4360 that, to make sure that has been satisfied. Joan. <laughs> if you turn to page 8 of 22 in your in your packet, this is the part that's been changed, and that's what we're going to read. There are Scriveners also in this, but this is, I want you to be aware, this is, okay. We're moving to, to change what citations are ineligible for traffic school. So 
page 8 of 22, uh, letter V under D. Following citations are ineligible for traffic school. Parking, <coughs> RV lot parking, <coughs> handicap parking, and specific moving violations such as hit and run. Valid driver's licenses not produced and reckless driving. And to supplement that, at the end there's a, a page of schedule of traffic monetary penalties and all the things on that which are starred are the points are the citations that are not eligible for traffic school. So that's the backup. And if you want to know the list, it's quite long. But this summarizes the exact, uh, the exact parts that are changed. So I move that we accept this change for traffic school. Discussion? Right. Yeah. Uh, there is a situation here that needs to be clarified so that you understand. When it says no driver's license produced, there are several instances when this occurs. For instance, if a person drives out of the community with not having been stopped, that means they haven't had the license produced. Or if it's a parking in a garage situation, no license produced. When they come before us on the traffic committee and they produce the license, that particular license is eliminated. However, if you do not produce your driver's license when you're being stopped, that's where this implies. So I just want to let you know that that's the clarification. So people understand that. Thank you. Anybody else? Joan. So, Ray, you're saying then if they produce their license at the hearing, that fine is dropped. Is that correct? Only on certain occasions. If you're driving and you're stopped and you refuse to produce your driver's license, mm -hmm. that is where this applies. If you're driving out of the community and they take your picture and license plate and your picture and you get a letter, when they come in and they do produce it, which mm -hmm. I check every license that comes in, the reason being because of insurance. Everybody that comes into the BD has to have the license, I check it. The security people will check it. That particular portion is eliminated. There's no fine on that. Okay. Only when you're driving, for instance, and you stop and say, I don't want to produce it, go to yeah. and produce it. When you that. refuse to produce it. Re okay, thank refuse you. to produce it, yes. That is when that applies, okay. just to let you know. So one more clarity. So if, let's say, you, you hear the silence and see security behind you, but you're really close to the gate and you outrun them, and you manage to get out of the gate. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. They take your license plate, picture okay. of your license plate, and a picture of the driver. They send a letter, then you come in before us in the community on the traffic hearing. That situation is where they do produce the license. Okay, that's eliminated. And they don't get fined for failure to no. stop? Oh, oh they, they get a fine. That, that has nothing. We're talking about the license. That's the only thing we're talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Oh, mercy. <laughs> oh, that is mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Then um, all those in favor. Oh, are we going to vote on this? Yeah. Are we voting on oh, this? Oh, oh, we can vote on oh, Okay. Ouch. They seem really tight, I think. Director Matson, I need your vote, and Director Gross. I've been hitting it three times. It doesn't register. Use your finger. There. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's unanimous. Passes. Thank you. So we're going to 12B, which is the GRF Committee Appointments Update. Okay. okay. GRF Committee Appointments Resolved. Today's date, it should say, uh, that the following persons are hereby appointed and ratified to serve on the committees of this corporation. I'm going to attempt to read just the changes, okay? Under Business Planning Committee, Jack Connolly is dropped, John Pearlston is now uh, for third, and Steve Parsons is the alternate for third. 
Under Finance Committee, Jack Conley is dropped and John Pearlson replaces him up for third. Under Landscape Committee, nothing, sorry. Maintenance and construction, nothing. Pack renovation, okay. Under Media and Communications, John Pearlston is dropped. Okay. Nobody added. And that's it. And uh, Steve Carmen remains. I think that was a mistake before. Okay, then under Disaster Preparedness Tax Force, John Pearlston is dropped for third. And under Laguna Woods Village Traffic Hearings, Jack Conley is dropped. Annie McCary is added for third. Reza Carmini is added as the alternate for third. Security and community access you need to do. Thank Kush. you. Missed one. Back to security and community access. Kush Bahada is dropped as the alternate for third. Okay. And that's all I have. That's it. I move that we accept this list. Second. Wait, I have a discussion. Oh, you're not seconding? Is there someone to second? I have a comment. Discussion You need a comment? second first. We got a second. Annette okay. seconded. So Dick has a comment. Yeah, wow. on their village. Pat oh, Pat to... mentioned it. So Pat goes first and then Dick. Right. Okay. I would like to draw your attention to two committees on this list. One is the PAC Renovation Ad Hoc Committee mm -hmm. on page 4 of 6, agenda item 11A. That committee is comprised of three GRF members, two third members, two united members, and it specifically states that there is a non-voting advisor. This has been set up according to our bylaws, and I have no complaints about it. However, when I go to the Village Energy Task Force, what I see now is that there are two people from GRF, two people from, well, one from United, two from Third, two from United, two from Third, one from Mutual 50, and then we have a voting advisor. There are two problems with this that it does not comply with our bylaws. There, um, first of all, there's non-voting advisors. Joan is um, stating that we are going to be discussing this in the closed meeting. So that specific, that, that this oh. specific item about the energy task force. So okay. we'll wait on that. Okay. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about the committees? Um, well, just that and the fact that we've got non-voting advisor. Oh, we've got a voting advisor on there that is not that, that, But we'll talk yeah. about that okay. in close. And I think Dick had something to say too, Richard. Yeah, Dick. my comment is on the Village Task Force. At the end, it says voting advisor Bill Walsh and non-voting advisor Bill Walsh. Which is it? <laughs> voting advisor. <laughs> <laughs> there can't be a voting by no. this is this is a task force this is not a committee doesn't matter no yeah. we'll discuss that at the we'll close session. Right. so right. so all of which will be discussed in close, close session. session okay okay anything else about this committee report judith. that's not about the energy <laughs> task force <laughs> judith okay um a lot of people are a little confused about how this list works and um they've come up to me and they notice like on the landscape committee, which now has become quarterly, or going to be in a few minutes. Um, Bert Maldow is the chair. And then on all these other committees, the second person that's listed, are we to assume that's the second chair? How do we know who the second chair is? Oh, vice chair. Vice chair, sorry. I, so, that, that really isn't, I, do you have a clarification now? How do we know who the vice chair is? So like if the chair doesn't show up. <laughs> it's, oh yes, it's someone from GRF, Joan says. I, uh, pardon? I said we could consider adding that to the list. 
Yeah, we, because, because I don't think we've ever noted it before who, who Yeah, for was. the last eight years that I've been a director on this list, the second person listed was the co-chair. That's right. always but, but it's never been like noted that this is co-chair. So You've never added it. So not under a landscape. Not a co-chair, but a second. <clears throat> my name is second, yeah, but sure. when Bert's not here, I'm not allowed to chair. Jim Matson jumps in the chair. And also when staff puts up the names of the landscape committee, they put Bert, then they put Jim Matz, and then they put me. Because they, and I asked them, they said they were told to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want me to be co-chair or act in that capacity, can you move me you down move to the, the third, third person? Position. That's what you're saying. Since you yeah. don't, don't want me to be co-chair. Because this is deceiving to the residents. They assume that I've been given some responsibility mm -hmm. when, in fact, I haven't. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Because you said staff doesn't want to work with me, so mm -hmm. you wouldn't give me any chair uh, committees. Thank you for bringing this up. I'm so going to add that it. to our closed can agenda. We do that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, will you remind us in the closed agenda of that? Okay. Dick. Yeah, I, I didn't get an answer to my comment. Oh, why the <laughs> bill and the bill? Yeah. Bill Walsh and Bill Walsh. We're, that's going to be discussed in closed okay. session. That was the answer to that. <laughs> okay. Anybody else on this the committee list? Okay. In which case, all those in favor? <coughs> Thank you. All those. Oh, wait. We're voting on the board. Thank you. Motion passes, thank you. Okay. We are on um, 15, 13, new business. Entertain a motion to introduce a resolution to authorize tw the 27 hole golf course summer closures. June initial notification, that's right now starting it, and it must be postponed 28 days for member review and comment to comply with Civil Code 4360. Okay. Do I have a motion? We have to read it. Pardon? Do we, read we have to read it first, okay. Resolution 19 XX, 27 hole <clears throat> golf course summer closures. Whereas at the May Community Activities Committee, CAC meeting, staff recommended approval to authorize the closure of nine holes per week as needed on the 27-hole golf course when extreme summer weather is negatively affecting the golf course to allow proper maintenance and time for the fairways and greens to recover. And whereas in July and August of 2019, the golf course was subjected to a very high, to very high temperatures and above normal levels of humidity, and whereas extreme weather caused extensive stress and damage on the different grass surfaces, creating poor playing and maintenance conditions, and whereas authorizing the recreation and special events department to close one course, nine holes, at a time during extreme summer weather allows maintenance personnel to perform necessary work to preserve the course's playability, and whereas the absence of golf and foot traffic on the fairways and greens will allow the grass to strengthen further, and whereas this closure protocol would be utilized if absolutely necessary, as determined by the golf course maintenance and operations managers. And whereas no financial impact is anticipated as there are fewer golfers in July and August, and those interested in playing would be accommodated on the remaining two nine-hole courses. Now, therefore, be it resolved June 4th, 2019, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces authorization of the closure of nine holes per week as needed on the 27-hole golf course when extreme summer weather is negatively affecting the golf course to allow proper maintenance and time for the fairways and greens to recover. Resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. 
I move that we accept this resolution for discussion purposes and postpone the final vote for 28 days according to Civil Code 4360. I second it. Seconded. Okay. Discussion. No. Nobody here? Nobody on the board discuss? So Cheryl, do you have people? Uh, not on this item, the next one. Oh. So nobody to speak on this? No. Nobody up here wants to? Oh, yes? I will support this amendment or this uh, motion, but I'm just curious. Uh, we've been in operation for 54 years. And you mean to say that in those 54 years, uh, the golf, they never shut down uh, one of the golf courses for maintenance. I mean, I don't understand why this motion is being put before us when it just hadn't been necessary all this time. Jim. In the, in the past, they um, shut down, actually, all the time. There were one nine hole is shut down all the time. And during that time, maintenance is done. I think this is something special um, that maybe that would result in two of them be shut down or something. It says one. It's only one night They're going to shut down for a whole week. Maybe we should alternate. Uh, right, you we, said it's an alternation. We yeah. have an expert here. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, the, uh, the the concept is um, so much that the, the conditions last year were extreme in 2018. We know that, and the golf the golf course the way that it's uh, the agriculture on the golf course can handle heat, it can handle humidity, and it can handle traffic, but just not all at the same time. And last year in Aug in July and August we had all three, and the golf course was 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 terrible. And we really were not able to do the process that we need to do to keep the golf course in shape. Now, Sean uh, Sincata and I both have, have discussed this at length. <clears throat> this is a really good option for us that we may not use, just depending on how the, how the mm -hmm. weather comes up. Because we, we have to really watch, we have to monitor, we have to monitor the conditions, we have to monitor the, the weather and, and how it's incoming. And maybe it's only going to be two or three days. Because there, there's a process for getting air into the root system, of the, especially on the greens. The Poa Anna does not like heat and humidity. And that's why usually you see it at, uh, at more seaside golf courses, which we are most of the time. And like the, the U.S. Open that you'll see uh, in, in two weeks is going to be played on Poa Anna greens right next, to the, right, right next to the ocean. But they don't get heat and humidity. And we generally don't get it to that extreme. So being able to keep people off of it, for a period of time allows Sean to quadratine the greens, to get some air down into the root system, to keep people from walking on the greens and, you know, three, 400 people a day. And the compaction, the lack of air, and the ability to water them for that period of time will keep everything alive in our estimation. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'll go ahead to Bert. I know, but I mean, I know in the past, uh, golf courses were shut down. So why are we even contemplating this when, when it already has been done? There seems, it just seems to me that there's no reason for this as a motion. I mean, you have the responsibility for maintenance of that golf course. And therefore, you have the right, I would think, to do what is necessary to maintain it. Why are we even entertaining a motion? Okay, I've got two people that would like to respond to that. I I think and Jim was first and then Annette. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, Burton on this. I think due, due to the, and Tom will definitely speak after me, but um, due to the number of people that play, I think he is subject to so much pushback that that is a consideration and he just feels that he has our support. And then I think, but I'll let him speak to this. What we did when we started thinking about this before it actually became an issue of discussion at CAC or even you know, with Brian Gruner, when we started to come up with this idea when we were in the throes of uh, the summer last year, was that there was a lot of other events that are going on. You know, the men's club, the ladies club, the, the 
the 9 and 18 hole versions of both of those. And a lot of people have events that run all through the summer. So what we're trying to, what we tried to do is we tried to say, okay, well, if we can do this, better maintain the golf course to give them a better product, then they would know ahead of time that this is a possibility during, we figured the week after the 4th of July, all the way, you know, six weeks going from there, that's the only time that it would even be a possibility that we think we'd have to do it. So we coordinated with all the clubs to say, we went, we went through the calendar and we said, okay, well, this may happen during this time, so you don't want to have a club championship, a president's cup, you know, or any special event, you'll have open play. And we coordinated with all of them because the nine hole people, the nine hole clubs have different play on Wednesdays and Tuesdays for the, for the men's and the ladies. So we coordinated with all of them just to say, this is a possibility during this time. So in the benefit for everybody, they would know ahead of time that it, it is a possibility. So I think it's, you're right as a, Sean Sincotta can, if need be, shut down nine holes at any time. And because he has to, because there's a water main break, because there's a disease breakout, because a tree falls down across one of the greens, you know, rabbit bats are around now. Maybe that, that that's something we can you know, we we can do that. But I think from a resolution standpoint, this gives full, you know, full clarity to everybody involved, and we've communicated <laughs> with all the clubs and all the people that play the golf course to give them a forewarning that this may happen. We have given you authors. I mean, likewise, we haven't given you authorization for some of the other things you just mentioned. Birds, birds, well, you know. <laughs> well. well, I think that's true, but it, it's, we, if we don't do it, then people are still going to be playing golf. And they'll be playing golf on greens that might be struggling. Yeah. But all we did with the clubs is give them a forewarning that this may happen. Not that it will happen, that it may happen. That's more than two times on one topic. Okay, um, it's going to be Joan and then Pat. This simply gives you the authority to do it when you need to. I don't see anything wrong with the motion. I know you've been doing your job all along and shutting down when emergencies occur, but this is kind of unusual with hot weather, and people may not think about that. Uh, oh, it's hot, I'm gonna go play golf. Why isn't everything open? And this is something, a, a little bit of an exception, and that may be why we needed a resolution. Okay, Pat. Yeah, well, last year we had a lot of drought and it was very bad. And I think that this gives Tom, our expert, I might add, the uh, opportunity to close it down in the event that we have another really hot and dry summer or, or there's any other reason for you to do that. I think it's an excellent idea. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to call on Jeff and then Annette. I, just from, from the staff point of view, um, and, and what, what's already said by Tom and everything. What the purpose of bringing this in front of you is to ensure that you understand that this is a program that we're going to in, potentially institute, and you are okay with it as a board. Right. If you're not okay with it, you may. But you're one. But I may have eleven, you know, nine, nine others saying no. We don't want you to ever shut the course down. So we're asked. We're basically saying our comfort level is we want to shut potentially shut the course down by, by nine holes in order to protect it. We want your concurrence and understanding that we're potentially going to do that. If you tell us no, then we won't do that. We'll come up with another program. If you're okay with it, then we will have it on the books that you're okay with it and we feel comfortable then instituting the program if necessary. Is that clear? Thank, thank you. Then it, it's Annette and then Ray. I definitely support this motion. Um, I think it's very proactive that you have our support. I was actually in the desert over Memorial Day, and I did a ride along in a golf cart since I'm not a golfer, and I saw some damage to courses and spoke to some people, and they said that those courses couldn't come back for a year, and I know how much revenue is generated by the golfers, so I really salute you for doing this. Thank you. You know, I think it's imperative that uh, the, the situation be handled exactly as he says. And here again, if you really damage the, the area, like you said, it's going to take a year to repair or more. That is really stupid. Do the repair. We, we have a professional person who knows what they're doing. We have staff that knows what they're doing. They're trying to keep it up. And if they see that something's wrong, Turn it down for a couple of days. No big deal. Get it repaired now rather than spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and close it down for a year. Thank you. 
Okay, this is uh, the second for Dick, yes. Yeah, I don't understand why this is such an issue. It it's, it's, depends on what the conditions are. Nobody can answer that question right now. So <clears throat> it's up to them to make that decision. I vote in favor. Okay, anybody else? Maybe here? one last time. Okay, that's your second. Yeah, I, I think this is very good. Uh, apparently, uh, every once in a while, there's a golfer that, that says, I don't care what the heck this place looks like, I just want to play golf. And so, that this would take care of that. So. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to make a comment here, just a little bit different look at it. As Tom was explaining the different groups that he talked with and looked at the calendar to find the right place, this is just another example of staff caring about our community and caring that the needs, looking at the needs of everyone and how this fits together. And I thank you, Tom, for bringing this to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to call a vote now. All in favor? Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel like continue to forget that we're on the. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. I, I pushed so my finger. No. I guess it worked. Yeah. Where it are we? We are on 13B. 13B. And it was fine. Yeah. Entertain a motion. And I want to thank Tom for coming in and giving that explanation. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Entertain a motion to approve a resolution to discontinue the use of herbicides containing the chemical ooh, glyphosate, glyphosate? Mm -hmm. is that right? <clears throat> where permitted by governing agencies and approve an unbudgeted expense of approximately $3,000 for alternative herbicide products. Entertain, and now Joan. There's no mention of the money in here. Really? Resolution 9019 X Alternative Herbicides. Whereas in response to concerns from the community regarding the safety of the herbicide Roundup and its main ingredient gly glyphosate, the board directed staff to investigate the potential use of viable alternative products. Whereas staff has determined that viable alternatives exist and are as efficacious as glyphosate, and whereas on May 15, 2019, the Landscape Committee recommended to eliminate the use of herbicide Roundup and its main ingredient, glyphosate, within the mutual, except where required by regulating agencies. Now, therefore, be it resolved, June 4, 2019, the Board of Directors does hereby eliminate the use of glyphosate-based products within the mutual, except where required by regulating agencies. This is wrong. Resolved further, the Board of Directors authorizes an unbudgeted expenditure of $3,000 from the operating fund for the increased cost of alternative herbicides. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Thank you. Do I have a second? Diane. Okay. Second. Discussion. Joan. I have a question. They say within the mutual, mm -hmm. and the words are, do they mean within GRF's yes. area? Then it's not a mutual, and we need to change the word. Yeah. That it's, it, it's on GRF responsible Within property. GRF property yes. or something? Right. This is applicable to the area that the landscape division maintains. Correct, but this resolution is for GRF. Yeah. Isn't it? Is it not? And then the yeah. mutuals have their own. Yeah, they have their own and their responsibilities around the manors. Ours is basically, basically around the clubhouses. Yeah. So maybe if we would it be appropriate to say uh, instead of mutual, change it to GRF property. Yeah, that makes so sense. So if you just make that a Scribner's. Just GRF. 
or not JRF, you can't say just JRF, JRF property. Mm -hmm. Maintained. Maintained by the Landscape Division. Yeah. yeah. Judith. Uh, one thing that came up at the meeting that a lot of people may not know, especially those on TV, the golf course is not maintained by the Landscape Committee. It's maintained by the Recreation Department. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it's been separate a long time, but that, that, that's a good clarification, Judith. People don't understand that. Okay, anybody else on this? Yes, Dick. Yeah, this has been controversial for years. I remember going to a meeting at City Hall where a lot of people were complaining. And I wasn't too concerned until I started listening to some TV commercials where the attorneys are saying that anybody's been affected by yeah. <laughs> yeah. insecticide that they consume. So I think it's time we did something. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Okay, anybody else? Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I know. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Go ahead. Okay, we have a request to speak from Sean Tom, to, Tom, Tom Payne. Tom Payne. I thought you were going to talk about golf. Good morning, yeah, everybody Sean. Everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I faked you all out. I really appreciate that. Um, I figured that Tom could handle that. I didn't need to weigh in. Um, on this, I've got a couple of questions and an and offer an opinion. The word, or the wording of the alternatives exist that are just as efficacious as by, let's say, I quarrel with that conclusion because it implies that they are the same. Whereas the finale that you're planning to use in its place is going to cost you more money, which is, I assume, why the three grand is in the further resolve. I am concerned that 3,000 isn't going to cover it by a long shot. So my question is, what happens if you go over plus or minus 10% of the three grand, are you going to throw more money at it? Do you need another resolution to say, well, we spend more money, or will you rethink the idea? Because in my opinion, you're going to talk about a seven-fold increase to the cost between using uh, Finale as opposed to Roundup. That's one thing. Uh, with regard to the question uh, or the point offered about seeing all the lawyers on the TV these days, uh, be advised that there is no conclusive evidence that glyphosate actually is a carcinogen. So we're all changing because we're afraid it might be. Well, you can get killed in a car accident too, but that doesn't mean you don't use a car. Not saying that glyphosate is not a good product or is a carcinogen, it may or may not be. Um, lawyers are pinning their hopes on the two or three cases in Northern California, the guy got $250 million award. And that's part of which, why everybody's saying, oh, well, the jury decided. Well, the jury isn't scientists. So yeah, I was, let's see, is there anything else here? I don't think so. But anyway, I'm concerned that this is going to be a financial burden that you don't really understand yet. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Joan. Joan and then Bert and then Judith. Is there any other hand over here that I didn't see? In answer, uh, what if we don't do it? I mean, we you don't have to don't this is just out there. I'm just I'm just commenting, okay. I'm in favor of the motion, but uh, the the department has done a very thorough testing of several very strong products. Some of them are just as effective as Roundup, and the one they the one they've chosen is the Finale. And although it's more expensive, it's not more expensive than some of the others. And if you read the charts, you can see that you know Finale really, although it's 588 percent higher than Roundup. It's, it's the, the least of the big ones, except for weed rot. And um, also, as far as the costs are concerned, every mutual and GRF is going to have to increase their budget in order to solve this problem. And if we don't solve it... What is the problem? The problem is the Roundup glyph glyphosate 
is the problem, and there's been enough pushback on that that we want to solve it and get rid of Roundup. Uh, so I'm in favor of the motion. But okay, and Bert's next. Thank you. Let me first address the cost issue. There is very little property <coughs> associated with GRF landscaping. You know, you, you're looking at uh, the flower beds around the clubhouses. Um, I'm hard-pressed to find out, I guess, the entranceways uh, into the community. So the, the figure that you're questioning is, is a valid figure. We do not use a lot of glyphosate in any event. Yeah, not, no, not really. Just on the basis that What's the discussion? No, no, no. We do not make we do not make that decision. I'm sorry. No, stop, Sean. Okay. 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 Secondly, the issue as to whether or not we want to switch over because supposedly it is a carcinogenic, even though there is no legal proof, it is. Probably a very wise move on our part because it's a way that we can avoid uh, a lawsuit. It's a way that we can avoid a lot of headaches and a lot of problems. Uh, it's the easy way out for us. And I agree. I mean, we don't even know if what we're proposing to use is, is a carcinogenic because nobody has really done anything to, to prove or disprove it. Okay, but, but this is just a way in which we can avoid problems. I know. Um, just a second. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify again that the landscape that is GRF landscape is basically the landscaping <coughs> around the clubhouses. It's not a whole lot of landscape. If you look at what the mutuals have, they have a lot of landscape. And I have different places to go here. I know that um, Kurt is back there. Would you like to come on up and address this? He's um, our person in charge of landscape. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, is there a pending question? I just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. And we called you up. Okay, Judith, would you say the question for him? Yeah, don't move. Um, I believe in the meeting, when you gave us at the landscape meeting the $3,000, you've included a 10% contingency in there as well. So we're covered if we spend more than we think we're going to. Right, but I don't believe right. we will. Okay, exactly. Thank you. We're answering his question. Is that it? <laughs> okay. Anything else for Kurt while he's here? Yes, Annette. Well, this, this speaks to the motion, basically, and, and you can give some answers and shed some light, but I'm going to speak my thoughts on this, so I would like you to listen, please, on this, the alternate to the herbicides. When I was looking at this, and I think all the reports and things you've done are great, I didn't know my own thoughts, if it doesn't include the labor costs of additional hours, if it took that, and then I noticed it was two times more application than existing, um, so, you know, basically because you apply it, then you have to go back two weeks later and, you know, apply additional. So I didn't know if I was, uh, after the initial application, when I read the different reports on this, so I was a little concerned. And then when we talk about GRF landscape, while there is a landscape committee, I understand you know, being the chair of CAC and recreation, golf falls under that, but that's also a GRF. So this would also be applicable to the people that are running the golf course. No. Is that not correct? No, it's, no, it's no. not. Okay. Well, as no. long as I, no. I'm, I would like to ask. Okay. No, this is does not apply to the golf course. Thank you. you. Thank you for that clarification. Right. That's one issue, and then the other one was the additional increased labor costs. That was my only other question. There is no additional labor costs. The the product we're using or proposing to use now is the same efficacy as Roundup, so it's same application, no increased labor. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Anybody Good. else for Kurt question? Thank you very much for coming up. Thank you. And Judith, did you have anything else to say? You're on my list. No, he answered it. On my list of that was wanting it. to speak. Yeah. No. Okay. Anyone out? We have uh, one other person out there that would like to speak on it. Yes. Um, Maxine McIntosh. Director Soleil answered my question. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyone else? I don't know. I'm going to ask Joan. Uh, could is it out of line for me to give Sean permission to come up and have no, three no, more no, minutes no, to no, speak? Go ahead. 
Is that on a line? Oh, no, Joan says I can no do it. So, so no objections? I don't object. Okay. Sean, come on up. I, I cut you off before I'm giving you some time. I appreciate that. Um, I, I probably misspoke. I did mean to imply that what you're voting on today will apply across the board to the community per se. What I do think it will do is you're setting the precedent for the entire community. And each of the mutuals, I know third is already was in the newspaper last week. The third is going to get rid of glyphosate, Roundup. Um, and eventually, in order to preclude a, a legal challenge or any sort of lawsuits and whatnot, it makes sense to go this route, perhaps. But the, the cost impact to each of the people who pay the HOAs is going to be, or could be, dramatic. And it will include the cost to uh, switch over to Finale, 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 excuse me, <clears throat> at the golf course and all the mutuals and the GRF. It will. I, the golf it will. I'm telling you that I've already seen what they will do on the golf course if they are made to change to Finale. Yeah. And this if, if yeah. all the mutuals and the GRF change away from Roundup, I see absolutely no stopping the, the groundswell of get rid of Roundup in the village. We want to be a Roundup free zone and that will that will affect the golf course and the cost attendant there too. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a money guy and I don't like spending money if we don't have to. And well, Finale may be as efficacious, although I seem to doubt it. I used uh, Roundup for 40 years so and I didn't use anything else because it wasn't as cheap or as good a product. That said, um, if we make the change, it's going to cost all of us. And I worry about that because in the days of rising prices for everything, why go out of your way to spend more money if you don't have to? Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, you've had two turns. Um, one more for Ray. Well, I'd rather be safe than sorry, and I'd like to prevent the lawsuits that would be happening, period, end of quote. Okay. Anybody else that hasn't had two turns? <laughs> You've only had one? I don't know. Joan, does he only had one? I don't know. Okay, Joan, go ahead. Uh, Kurt, isn't there, aren't there some places that Roundup is required? Yes, we say so. Excuse me, Kurt. Because it says something about except for places where where roundups required. And I assume that's the golf course edges and so on. The, the creek, maybe. Only in the creek is it required. The state, the water regional water quality board requires us to use a special um, water safe mixture yeah, right. um, in the creek bed and yeah. three feet up the slopes, and that's all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, Dick. Yeah, I, this is sort of an aged community, and I think older people are more subject to irrita irritable chemicals. So I think we're better off playing it safe rather than r risking. I'm, okay. That's all I have to say. I'm voting in favor of this. Okay, Annette. I'm in favor of this motion too, especially for the concern of our VMS employees applying the product and concern for the public and for the environment. Okay, no one else? I'm going to say, oops, Pat. Uh, well, my concern would be that uh, we're getting rid of Roundup now, but who's to say that whatever takes its place, we might not be here a year from now doing exactly the same thing with whatever that is. That would be my only concern. And if it ends up costing us a lot more money, 3000 is not a lot more. But if it ends up costing us a lot more money, that would be unfortunate. Thank you. OK, we are going to vote now. OK, it's unanimous. Thank you. C 
13C, entertain a motion to revise the Landscape Committee to meet quarterly. Joan. Resolution 90-19XX, change the Landscape Committee meeting to a quarterly schedule. Whereas in response to the reduction of GRF landscaping issues, the Landscape Committee unanimously voted on May 15, 2019, to recommend changing the meeting frequency from bi-monthly to a quarterly schedule beginning in August 2019. Now, therefore, be it resolved, June 4, 2019, the Board of Directors does hereby approve changing the Landscape Committee to a quarterly schedule. Resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. Second. Us. Okay. Bert second it. And so discussion, Joan first. I'm definitely in favor of this motion. Thank you. Bert. Oh, I thought you hand us up to speak. I no. Discussion. Okay. Oh, Annette. Okay, I'm definitely in favor of this motion, but um, in reading it, I thought it was going to meet on the second Wednesday of the appropriate month. Conflict. Okay, conflict. I'm sorry. I withdraw that then. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, all those in favor, vote on your screen. Should be 13C, Cheryl, not B. You're correct. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Um, pardon? Eleven to nothing. It's unanimous. Okay. Um, now we are on thirteen. D. And um, before I read this, I'm going to ask my first vice president to help keep track for me if, because I know this is going to be a big discussion item and people that uh, on the board, our rule is that we get to speak twice on one topic. And I, I've been trying to keep track of that in my mind as I go along and I, I don't think I'm perfect. I think I was wrong with Bert this last go round. I don't know, but anyway, Joan, not Joan, <laughs> this side, Annette, <laughs> will will keep track during this discussion because I think we have a lot of that going on. So anyway, here we are. New business, 13D. Entertain a motion to remove Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime Ticket from the 2020 cable television channel mm -hmm. lineup. This is a June initial notification. It must be postponed 28 days for member review and comment to comply with Civil Code 4360. I will entertain a motion. What is it not written that way? What? You don't have the whole thing? Wait, uh, let me check on mine. 13D. C. I've got 13 D right here. It's white. Okay, I've got it. I'll read it. Oh, it's not complete. Oh. Okay, we're going to have Joan read this, but I don't know what's going on, Cheryl. It's, it's not blue, and Joan says Excuse it's not me. complete. This is just, good morning. This is just a conceptual discussion. There is no resolution associated with this today. We don't, we should never. The resolution that is attached to the agenda report is a prior resolution that was approved by the GRF board. So we're just having a conceptual discussion this morning, hoping to reach a uh, decision from the board as to how to move forward. So, so Joan will address. Joan, Joan sorry. Okay. Maybe. Maybe we should chuck. Yeah, he. We're gonna. That will happen in a minute. You okay. read yours, and then I'm gonna. After After Joan reads this resolution. Okay, it's not I'm a resolution. Ask, it's this not, is not a resolution. It's not a resolution. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not a resolution. After Joan reads this. What I read is the discussion that we're going to have. Will speak. Okay. 
I'm going to ask Jeff to speak after Joan reads this, and then Chuck will speak after Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Go, Potential elimination of Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime ticket from broadband services 2020 channel lineup. Recommendation of the staff is that we discuss the potential elimination of Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime ticket from broadband services channel lineup, effective January 1st, 2020. <coughs> and one of the reasons we're bringing this up now is that Chuck has to set his budget for 2020. So we need to consider this as a possibility. Um, Chuck, can you come up and present the main points that we need to discuss? Jeff wanted to go first. Jeff, I'm sorry, Jeff. We're gonna, we're gonna do it in tandem. Um, okay. So to the, to the board, um, I just wanted to make a couple comments and then um, lead into the the dialogue by um, Chuck's going to do the full presentation. There are a couple of um, facets here that have led us in this direction. One, um, in um, developing this next year's budget and looking at cost savings, um, expenses, and issues that um, are significant to the community, um, this is one that um, um, Chuck, doing his job, um, informed me. Uh, of a you know significant potential significant increase uh, that may be coming forward from um, both uh, Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime Ticket, um, as well as additional costs that are going to be coming forward relative to um, uh, the, the operation of our broadband service, which Chuck's going to give you a little bit of highlights on. Um, in the um, upcoming closed session, I would also like this item to be agendized um, because some of the information that you may have questions on relate to specific contracts that we will be entering in negotiations with. Those contracts and those negotiation items are not um, appropriate to be in open session. They should be in closed session. So if we do that later um, today, we'll, we'll dialogue specifically about any of those. Um, but within that context, um, and, and Chuck's going to go into this. It's also um, there is a need and a legal requirement, and, and that we'll get into details about this, about our requirements to encrypt the information um, that is being provided via the, um, the broadcast. So with that, um, if I can get Chuck to come up, and he's got a great PowerPoint presentation. We'll walk you through and then engage with you, kind of um, looking to seek information of how you want to move this forward if you if you do want to move it forward, and the financial impacts if we stay the status quo. Good morning. <clears throat> Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, good morning, Madam President, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I wanted to kind of reiterate uh, what Jeff was saying earlier about the uh, operation of the broadband services as it relates to programming costs. Uh, we see uh, as more and more people in the outside world cut the cord, as they say, in the cable industry, it leaves the rest of us who are paying for cable TV to pay more. So what we have, uh, what I'm seeing here is a significant cost increase by these two Fox regional sports channels that are, uh, you know, well into the seven figures here that we need to discuss. These contracts are expiring at the end of this year, and what I'm trying to do is bring this to everybody's attention, to the community's attention. Do we think that these channels provide enough value for the money that we're paying for, right? So I'm going to give you a presentation today uh, on that. First thing we want to take a look at is uh, why are we doing cable TV? What, how, what's the benefit of this being a shared amenity at the community? Talk to you a little bit about what our bulk program agreement. Because cable TV is a shared amenity, we all pool our resources together to get a bulk cable agreement with these cable operators. So it significantly reduces their costs. So if you're looking at uh, our, our annually, our most our largest cost for cable TV is programming. What is programming? Programming is channels like CBS, ABC, Fox, ESPN, so on and forth, so forth. So as far as your cable TV operation, the largest amount that you spend is on programming. If I can refer you to the slide here, you can see it in uh, 2020, it's looking like we're budgeting for about $5.6 million in programming next year. It's a pretty significant increase to what you're paying this year. 
But if you have, and that's with a bulk agreement, $5.6 million a year. Just think if you didn't have a bulk agreement, if I can get your, your attention to the second bullet point, because you this is a shared amenity and you're all sharing costs and pulling your resources, you'd be paying $11.5 million for programming instead. So by, you being, by this being a shared amenity and being able to collectively pull our resources and our subscribers together, we're saving the community $5.9 million in there. So I want to understand, just understand the importance of why the uh, cable TV is a shared amenity is to your benefit. So what does that really mean to the average homeowner who's re average resident in their assessments? We go to the next slide here. I'm running it, so I guess I can pass it over. <laughs> so next year, it's looking like th this year you're paying $19.32 per man or per month out of your assessments for basic cable TV. We're looking at some significant increases in programming. Look, next year, it's estimating that the, the cost out of your assessments per month is going up to $25 per man or per month, right? Um, without the bulk agreement, just think how much you'd be paying. You'd be paying $62.50 or $62 per manor per month, which is probably very close to what you'd be paying at Cox or Spectrum at Tom Warner. So having that bulk agreement and that shared services is saving us about $37 per manor per month. So I thought that'd be important for you guys to notice that because we're going to refer back to the slide a little bit later. So this brings me to the, 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 the main crux of my presentation today is we have... Uh, uh, two different Fox contracts. One Fox, co Fox contract that we have is with NCTC. This is Channel 11, this is Fox News, this is Fox Sports 1, and Fox Sports 2. Ta let's take those off the table. We're not talking about those. Those are staying as is. What I'm referring to is our two regional sports contracts with Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime Ticket. Now, if you have, maybe, maybe or may not you follow this, but uh, Disney bought out the Fox product several years ago, and, but recently, sold off Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime Ticket to the Sinclair Group. This gives us an opportunity to negotiate pricing separate from Fox News, separate from Fox Channel 11, and separate from our Fox Sports 1 and 2. These particular two channels, out of the $5.6 million that you're spending on programming every year, 33% of the entire cost are these two channels. Those two channels alone are costing you well over a million dollars. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. The reason why is these contracts are expiring at the end of this year. We're looking at a 20 to 25% increase in Fox Sports or Fox Sports Prime Ticket, uh, excuse me, Fox Sports West or Fox Sports Prime Ticket next year. So that, con that cost is even going to go up even higher. So the discussion today is like, as a community, do or do we not want to renew those contracts? Let's say we did not want to renew the contract. What is that going to do for our, for our, our assessments? Right. I know this, this slide's a little bit busy, so please bear with me here. Um, right now, what we're trying to do here is you, you can see in column number one, which is current 2019, I have all the different, the main folks out there who are renting devices for us, right? If you directly plug into the wall and the only thing you're paying out of your assessment is $19.32, okay? That's what everybody's paying. But if you're renting a set-top box, you're paying an extra $13.25. So your $19 plus your $13.25, that's giving you the 3257. If you have a two two tuner DVR, you're paying 3857. And if you have the whole home DVR product with one device, it's 4427. But look what look what's happening in 2020 with by Fox increasing some other increase in programming fees, transmission fees. That's going up to 2483. Right? You can see the price increases if we have Fox. But what I wanted to bring to your attention, how, why Fox is such this Fox contract is so concerning to me, and I wanted to bring to your attention. If you didn't renew Fox, look what that's doing to your assessments. You're going from $19 down to $13, right? And so on and so forth down the line. $44.27 for your, uh, for your whole home DVR down to $38.01, okay? But that cost savings, what we're looking to do is to be able to reinvest some of those funds that you're saving from Fox to make sure that folks out there who are plugging directly into the wall have a device. Why do they need to have a device? It's because right now we're broadcasting all these cable TV channels in the clear, which is jeopardizing our bulk agreement. Remember that bulk agreement I was mentioning earlier? We're, it, we're saving about $5.9 million a year because we're all sharing. If we don't follow the rules of the organization by encrypting this content, the, we're jeopardizing that arrangement for that bulk agreement. So my idea is if we could possibly not renew Fox TV, or excuse me, Fox Sports regional uh, channels, we could reinvest some of that money into those 
into the system where, whereby folks out there have a device on their TV to encrypt the content. It gives an ability to have a digital channel guide. It also re, uh, removes the need to have those sub-channels, 6.1, 6, 7.2, so on and so forth. And, it, it, and folks will no longer have to scan their television to, uh, to get content. We know when we removed analog, by, by not just removing, analog went away, remember last year? So all these TVs that we have plugged directly into the wall that don't have a device, they're having a lot of customer service issues. The channel, the channel three guide, the analog channel three guide is made for analog televisions. It's not made for digital televisions, so the channels aren't lining up. The, every time we make a channel change, because channels change you know, periodically uh, every month, folks have to rescan their televisions. So what we're trying to do is like, okay, let's if if we didn't renew Fox, what could we do with that capital to reinvest it into the into the system to provide a device in everybody's home? And so, that's, so that's the core crux of what I'm trying to put down to you. To add to that, and one of the most important things that Chuck focused on that is kind of one of these things that we lose track of, and that is we we have that great bulk advantage, but that that agreement to get that bulk advantage says that this channels need to be encrypted. The people that plug into the wall right now are not encrypted. So we're running into the jeopardy that these companies are going to come in and say, you know, that bulk deal is no longer valid and you're going to lose $6 million. Our costs are going to go up. The way we validate it, the way we meet our legal obligation is that the people that are plugged into the wall right now are going to be required to have this new device. That new device is $7.95. So if you look at it today, when you go to the line two, if we keep Fox, that direct plug-in person's going to have to pay additional seven. So they're going up to $32, not 24. They're going to 24, even if we don't follow the law, <laughs> right. which we can't do. Um, so we're going to have to have them be encrypted. So that's going to take them up to $32, almost $32. So what we're looking at is if we cut the Fox channel, we're able to save that $6. And so what in effect happens to that person right now who's got a plug in, their rate's going to go from 19 to 21. In, in, in their overall cost. They're going to pay $7 for the fixture, but they're, in a sense, going to get a discount on their assessments. So their assessment's going down, but their individual cost is going up. And that's how you get to that end product of $21. Hopefully that you get that. Um, right. So I want to make sure when we say investment, we're making investment in the overall cost for the individual, but not the individual who's plugging in is going to pay $7 for this set, but then they're also going to get a lowering of their assessment, just like everybody else would. Fair, fair enough. But also the important is there's a lot of customer service issues with digital TVs that are plugged directly into the wall. As uh, Maxine had pointed out earlier, there's no more guide. The channels don't are always, you always got to scan in channels. There's customer service issues. We feel that by getting a device onto each of these TVs, all those issues go away, right? You have one remote, one TV, one guide for the whole entire community that all matches the channels that we're uh, broadcasting. Okay, just um, wait, I wanna make sure that they're, Jeff, we're done. And Jeff and Chuck, are you okay? Yes. We'll start with questions, Annette's first. Okay, I, <clears throat> I think this is a great idea. So basically, if I read this chart right, what you're really telling folks at home that plug directly into the TV is that for an additional dollar and 69 cents per month, you can have, and we can stay within the law, compliance with the encryption, you get a set top box. So basically, if we do no Fox for 2020, the difference for these people that plug into the wall right now will be an increase of a dollar sixty-nine. That's what's going to hit their pocketbook, and then what's going to happen to VMS is all the money that we're going to save for VMS labor because it's driving you crazy. As far as all of this stuff, it's a huge—I mean, it's a huge drain on your staff. 
So that kind of is a net. I mean, everything else here with no fox, the set-top foxes, the turners, most of those people pretty much I would say no that's going to happen. I think the people that are most affected are the direct plug-in, which probably are the senior seniors in the community. And I don't know if you then for $1.69 more per month, which I'm sure that they would think would be wonderful if they didn't have to go through, they get the, they know what television program to look at, then you could go through with even more simplification. Um, right. I'm, I'm very much for this as far as no Fox and, and you know, the increase, so everybody gets, a, everybody, and that, that I'm assuming would not be standard, it would be all HDTV. Correct. And we'd have to make sure everybody understands we're not doing standard. We're doing HGTV all across the board. So everybody IT-wise gets a lift. Thank you. Okay. John, were you next? I want to speak for the other side, the people that like to watch Fox. And we don't know how many. Unfortunately, we can't ascertain that. However, as you pointed out, there are many alternatives. And one of the alternatives that I've researched is to be on the internet via the uh, Amazon Fire Stick and go to go to ESPN. And for four dollars and ninety-five cents per month, if if you join Amazon Prime, which is about one hundred nineteen a year, you get a huge number of perks. So it's worth investigating alternative means for those of us who are real hot sports fans, and there are many of us. Thank you. Um, Dick is next. Yeah. Are you saying, when you say no Fox, you're going to cut all the Fox programs? No, sir. No. Just, no. Just What's not? Uh, Fox Sports News, uh, Fox uh, KTLA, oh, it's, is it Fox 11, Fox Sports 1, and Fox Sports 2 all stay. No, not impacting Fox television at all. It's just the two regional channels, Fox Sports West and Fox Sports yes. Prime ticket. Do you have a record of how many people watch each station? We do not. The channel numbers are in the staff report as well as the alternatives. If, if let's say we do uh, decide, the board decides to uh, not renew this contract, we gave them options in the staff report of what they could do to stream this content online. Okay, and then. And speaking to this same thing for people that say, oh, Amazon Prime, $79, Amazon Prime does have a low income package for people who really are struggling. And they also have one day in July where you can join for free and then you can hook in, I believe. Amazon Prime is $9.92 per month, but you join for a year and that's 119 Okay, there was another hand over here. Here, yeah, Pat. Yeah, um, I totally support this idea. However, my concern is how are we going to get this to an open session to vote on it if we can't do it now here? Well, oh, right. That's a very good question. That's why we're bringing this up to discussion because it's a very serious discussion. We want to get it out there for Giraffe because we didn't want to run into the same situation we did with KTLA where it wasn't, you know. The community felt that they weren't noticed appropriately. I wanted to get that out here, make sure that we're all on board. So when we come here, I, think I would imagine next month to make a uh, uh, put together a resolution to vote on at our next month's meeting. That way we can uh, be in time for our budget. Good. Thank you. Okay. Diane. One thing I just wanted to say about your um, numbers is that you are assuming that this is you're assuming that everyone, the people only have one television because you would have to get a box for every single television. That is correct. But the fees, the fee structure is the same for, it's by manner, not, not, not by device. One thing I wanted to bring to your attention, if you look up on the screen here, the folks out there who are renting a set-top box, to your point, Diane, at our last meeting, you'll see the, if we kept Fox, your, if you have a set-top box, your price is going from $38. It's actually going to be lower. If you're already renting a set-top box, your price is going down. So it's just those folks who are directly plugging into the wall, their assessment's going to go up by a dollar or so. Ray. Uh, I'm not addressing this, but I'd like to ask permission after he's finished with this. I have three very, very important situations on TV, uh, broadband. I've been trying to get hold of Chuck. He's been at meetings for the last three days, or uh, two days for sure. It's extremely important that we be able to discuss it. I think it's I built really important. 
anyone else? Siobhan? I just wanted to mention to the board that the third board has passed out a letter of support for the non-renewal of these two regional sports channels. You should have a copy in front of you. Right. And also at the media and communication, they also uh, voted four to three to not renew, <coughs> not renew these as well. Is that correct, Joan? Okay, just to reiterate what we just said, Chuck just said that the Media and Communications Committee voted yes with this idea, this possible resolution, and the third board wrote a letter to our board stating that they were behind this. Okay. Um, anyone else? Diane. One other comment. People are getting confused that, that maybe we're going to get rid of Fox News. So is it possible for us to refer to these as Sports Network West and Sport, Nest and Sport Prime and have, as opposed to Fox? Uh, they are Fox channels. We can look at, we can say you know maybe FS, FS, Sports so West and FS. Just so that they're not going to, yeah. Prime ticket. Joan? The vote was close in MNCC, and I think it was because there wasn't complete understanding of the possibilities of streaming services. So when that comes up, let's be very clear that although there are three mentioned here in the report, there are others, and they're Correct. still less expensive. People find a way around. Correct. Uh, yes, Cheryl. I have some requests to speak on this item. Mm -hmm. I'd like to call Winita Skillman. Thank you, Chuck. Please stay, please stay close by for questions. <laughs> First and foremost, I definitely support uh, <clears throat> dropping these two channels just because they serve a, such a minority of our uh, community and, and it sent such a tremendous cost when you're talking 33% of what we're paying for everything else. Uh, it just really doesn't quite make sense for those two. However, I'm really confused about what this board is being asked to do. Are you taking a straw vote on do we want to drop these two channels? This board, as a board, has no resolution or, or motion or whatever to do that because if you go back to your resolution that set this up, independent contracts are executed by two GRF officers and reviewed in executive session. It is not something that this board in open session um, has a purview to say we will do or won't do, except like as a straw vote, we support doing that. So I think you just need to be careful of what it is you're voting on. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. I'm going to ask Joan to respond to that. I'm not sure we'll take a vote, but we will give staff direction to uh, develop a, a real resolution next month. I don't think we can actually take a vote yet. We need a resolution. <laughs> Excuse me, whatever. Uh, and, and, and it would come up next, next month. But we felt it should come forward because of the budget. OK, Cheryl. Uh, <coughs> next request to speak is by Mary Stone. Oh, I'm sorry, Pat. Did you want to speak? I just am concerned about the timing issue. I think if we don't get this done today, do something about it, that uh, it's going to get the it won't get into the budget. So I think we need to do something, whether it's a store vote or whatever we decide to do. But I think we need to do something. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Yeah, uh, like uh, Juanita said, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, your any decision making that you do should be done in executive session. This is a place where you can discuss it because you're discussing it uh, as a budget idea, not as a contract, you know, going over the terms of the contract and all of that. That you handle in executive session. However, uh, I think that one of the things that hasn't been pointed out in these numbers that were given is that when a when individuals, when our residents get the, uh, the new box, they will also get a remote, a remote for the box, and then they would have a remote or whatever device they use for controlling their TV. It will mean they're going to have an additional 
piece of equipment that they're going to have to use to select their channels and to select their guide. So they all have to learn how to use those, I, those remotes. OK, Chuck, can you respond to that, please? The, uh, in regards to the remote, you can program the remote to operate your uh, DTA and your TV simultaneously, so you don't need to have multiple remotes. If you have a VCR or DVD player, yes, you would have to have a separate remote. But if it's just your TV and that little DTA, you can get it on one remote. OK, so that answers Mary Kristen. Thank you. Um, somebody else? Yeah. I have one more request to speak from Maxine McIntosh. Thank you. Maxine's taken care of. OK, and was there someone else here? You go ahead. I move that we direct staff to proceed with a, a proper resolution regarding this for our next meeting. Do I have a second? OK, Ray seconded it. Um, discussion, Pat. Yes, could I have that um, uh, modified to read that we'll have a special meeting for it so we can get on to it right away? Um. Could I get a second can you on flush? that? Can, no, you don't need a second. I, I, you can give me a friendly amendment so he hasn't put it on the force. So that we have a special meeting to clarify or to what? What do you want a, to a do? A special meeting to get this resolution uh, underway. Sooner than, sooner than next month. Yes. You make that decision in close the session. session. You don't need Today. a resolution. You don't need a resolution. It's not an you can't make okay, a decision okay. in close They're session. They're saying we could have it in closed session oh, today. I don't think so. You can give that direction to Chuck. You have that power in this resolution. Yeah. Do it today. I'll let Joan decide this because this is beyond my pay scale. Thank you. <laughs> this is beyond my pay grade too. So Joan, I can withdraw my motion and then you can go ahead and figure it out. But I don't know. I, I so. Let's get may, Jeff. Let's get to, Jeff in on this. To the president um, and to the board, I think that the, the, what's being raised is the question of the ultimate action by GRF to to um, negotiate or end terminate um, the contracts with Fox is one that is in closed session, which I mentioned at the beginning of my. Um, the dialogue here is. Um, is in a sense getting consensus from the board that we want to move in a certain direction. When we go into closed session, we can talk about the timing of that action, which would address um, Ms. English's um, concern. Um, we can address that in closed session too as to the timing of how that would occur. Okay, kind of pull it all together when we're yeah. in closed session. And Joan just hmm. said, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay, and Judith. Then I move that we move 13D to closed session. Do I have a second? Does it need a second? Well, I'll second it, oh, just okay. for the heck of it. Oh, OK, sorry. Ray seconded it. So all those in favor? Are we? Well, it's unanimous, so. So this will be brought to, the, to our closed session today. OK. Now may I ask? Uh, yeah, right. get permission. Sure. Uh, Chuck, if you wouldn't mind, stand up. I have a couple of things that were very, very important. Uh, first off, on the channel lineup for Channel 6, since last week it says you know, uh, Laguna Woods LO. All the way across, 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 going forward. Now, I understand it's an outside company. There was a mistake. My question, my, my, my situation is this. The booklet explaining what programs would be handled on Channel 6 was not delivered until yesterday. So I'm just wondering, couldn't we let the people know on a special deal saying the regular channeling will be handled uh, properly, uh, you know, there's glitches, something, so forth and so on. Just a thought. Because, you know, us old people couldn't figure out what, what are we going to have a program or not. Then I was told, yes, you can watch the movie, but you can't record it. So. These are the things that are, that, that are important to put to the people. Just a thought. Thank you. Secondarily, last week I had a, 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 a copy of the program. I tried to erase it seven times. It would not erase. 
So I called in and they said they'd reboot. They did reboot. However, the same program was still there, but I could erase it this time. However, I had recorded various things for the week before and the week after, and then all of a sudden it says, um, um, it had a box on it with a red circle in it, and then on the end it had number two. So I'd hit the button to play, nothing happened. Um, in addition, I had a situation where I attempted to record two programs. Uh, one, uh, uh, let's see, um, I, I attempted to do the program, um, and it had a circle with a line going from right to left. I could not change that under any circumstances. So these are the things that us old people need to know how to be able to take care of. And if you can imagine if we had everybody in this village calling in to your, your place, you know, of a broadband with those things that I'm bringing up, that would be a real problem. So I'm just suggesting maybe there's some methodology you could develop, you're such a smart guy, that would assist on this, okay? Just a thought. Thanks, Ray. All right, I, I don't think that there's anything else, and I do understand that sometimes uh, that stuff happens. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck, for looking into it, okay? Uh, basically, now we're to the point of the meeting where there is committee reports. The entire committee reports can be found at uh, www.lagunawoodsvillage.com slash residents slash golden hyphen rain hyphen foundation forward slash documents if you're interested. And Diane, the report of the finance committee financial reports is next, Director Phelps. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, before I get into the details of the April financials, I'll start off again this month with some information about GRF's finances. <clears throat> I explained a few months ago that GRF has two separate and distinct funds of money, reserve and operating funds, and that the two can't be used interchangeably. I've also talked about monthly assessments, which are one of the sources of revenue GRS has for its reserve and operating funds. Each month we include a slide with a pie chart showing some of the other sources of revenue <coughs> GRF uses to meet its operating and reserve obligations. Today I'll, I'll elaborate just a bit on those. We have two sources of revenue for our reserve obligations in addition to the $17 we pay per man or per month. Uh, one source of revenue uh, wait. One source of revenue for our reserve funds is the interest we earn on our reserve funds. The other is trust facilities fees, sometimes referred to as transfer fees, which is the primary source of revenue for our reserve funds. This is the $5,000 charged to most people purchasing a manor. The important message here is that in years like, like this year, when fewer houses are being sold than we anticipated, the impact of that is to our reserve funds and not to our operating fund. On the other hand, uh, instead of just having two, we actually have many sources of revenue for our operating fund. These, such as broadband services, which includes the set-top box rentals, premium channels, advertising, ad production, cable service calls, and, and internet charges. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, golf operations, which include greens fees, golf cart rentals, lessons, driving ranges, and locker rentals. Merchandise sales, generally from the golf pro shop. Sales from uh, events with a GRF bar and bartender. Uh, not the 19 restaurant bar, but whenever you're at an event and there's a GRF bar and a GRF bartender, um, GRF is, is uh, earning money from that. We have a lot of sources. Some of the others I'll mention are clubhouse room rentals, ticket sales for shows put on by our recreation department, equestrian center fees for boarding, feed, and lessons, bridge room fees for players who don't live in Laguna Woods Village, fees for some recreation department classes, uh, fees for renting RV lot spaces and garden and tree plots, resident ID, auto decals, and RFID charges, and yes, traffic violations. These non-assessment sources of revenue don't make a profit for GRF's operating fund. We operate under a shared cost concept, so the revenue helps offset some of our shared costs. However, the non-assessment revenue we receive does keep down our assessments. And now I'll go to the slides. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. 
so this is for the reporting period ended April 30th, 2019. These are our preliminary financial statements. Through the reporting period and, uh, ended April 30th, total revenue for GRF from all sources was $14.4 million, and total expenses was, were $13.4 Point four million, resulting resulting in net re, re, excuse me net revenue just over a million dollars. Slide two. In finance, we keep a close eye on the operating portion of our financial results. As you can see on this slide, the operating fund without depreciation shows an operating surplus of two hundred eighty nine thousand dollars through the reporting period. Slide three. This next. Next chart shows the same figures of the income statement from slide one, but adds a column to compare them to budget. We can see that GRF ended the period worse than budget, by, but it was only by $17,000. Slide four. This slide shows our most significant variances by category with green bars representing favorable variances and orange bars representing unfavorable items. So one area we'll look at is revenue. We had less revenue than expected in the trust facilities fees. It was less, uh, it was 250,000 less than, um, than we had planned on. And golf operations were $161,000 unfavorable due to rain requiring course closures and limiting golf carts to the golf cart pass. On the other hand, on the plus side, we had $126,000 more in interest income than budgeted, helping to offset some of the shortfall in the trust facilities fees. Um, we also uh, look at the area issue of timing. Budgets are spread evenly throughout the year, but certain expenditures occur later in the year. So we had favorable variances that are only temporary in categories such as repairs and maintenance, which was positive by $128,000, and materials and supplies, which were positive by $108,000. And the last area I'll mention were some true savings. So some variances resulted from an operational savings, and they may continue throughout the year. These include employee compensation, which was $103,000, uh, positive due to less participation in medical and retirement benefits and utilities that were 48,000 due to less usage of irrigation water because of the rain. I'll move on to slide five. Expenses to date of 11.9 million, excluding depreciation, are shown on this pie chart with our largest categories being compensation, cable TV, utilities, insurance, and outside services. The ratio of these expenses changes as work is performed throughout the year. Slide six. This pie chart shows non-assessment revenues that I mentioned earlier. To date, we have received almost $4.1 million. Broadband services generated the most revenue, followed by the trust facilities, fees, golf operations, and so forth. And again, it's important to remember, non-assessment revenue keeps uh, down our assessments. And slide seven. This slide shows resale history from 2017 to 2019. Community-wide sales this year through April 30th totaled 229, which was lower than, pri than in prior years. Most of these transactions generate the trust facilities fee, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the primary source of revenue for our reserves. And then on slide eight, um, this shows the reserve and contingency fund adjusted balances. Starting with the first column on the left, the funds show a combined balance of $29.6 million. Included in this total are contributions received this year through assessments, trust facilities fees, and interest earnings. And then the second column shows work in progress of $5.7 million, reflecting the amounts paid for projects that are not yet complete. The third column shows the net of the first two. So the net adjusted fund balances are $23.9 million. Slide nine. We compare our current year but, uh, balances to historical fund balances for the past five years. Uh, GRF has averaged about $23 million in reserve and contingency funds over the last five years. And then there's slide 10. 
the, the list on, <clears throat> excuse me, the list on this slide gives you an idea where our reserve funds are committed. Of the $23 million appropriated by the board for various projects and equipment purchases, the remaining encumbrances against our reserves and contingency funds is $16 million, primarily for renovation projects. <clears throat> That's it for the slides, but I remind you that more detail is included in the GRF board meeting agenda packet, and, ad and in addition, much more detail is provided in the GRF finance department meeting agenda packets, which are available online and at GRF finance committee meetings. We did not have a finance meeting in April. Our next finance meeting will be Wednesday, June 19th at 1.30 in the boardroom. This month, we will also have a GRF capital plan review meeting on Monday, June the 10th in the boardroom at 1.30. Both of these meetings are open, so if you are a member, you are welcome, even encouraged, to attend either or both of these meetings to hear what's going on. And last but not least, I want to thank Director Pat English for filling in for me last month and giving the finance report. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Diane for the detail in her report and for providing so much clarity to us. Thank you so much. Okay, where we are now is CAC Community Activities. Director So. Good morning. Basically, we had our meeting on Thursday, May 9th, 1.30 here in the boardroom. And what was discussed was the Village Games. We had 381 participants and over 800 medals were distributed in total. We also had on Monday Night Movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, which was a sellout, and Recreation has booked a, different, a second showing. We also went ahead and uh, the lights in Clubhouse One Gym have been retrofitted with the covers that they needed. There were a few that were remaining, and uh, this morning I was there taking a stretch class and noticed that it's totally complete now, which is great. Mr. Uh, Brian Gruner stated that the current ActiveNet program has been updated to allow residents to view room availability online. Etiquette signs are being posted at the facilities. The comprehensive staff training will be hosted on August the 14th, as approved. And Mr. Gruner also stated that he was at an event at Rancho and Mission Viejo and noticed the facilities, including the restroom, were all swipe-based for convenience. So anybody that was a member there had to swipe for everything. So we did mention that. June 6th is the first of three patio concerts with Black Market Trust. Tickets are $10 each. On June 16th, Clubhouse 2 will host a Father's Day brunch. The afternoon tea will be on June 17th at Clubhouse 7 at 2.30. Tickets are $18. On June 18th at Clubhouse 5 at 11.30, the 90s luncheon will be hosted. Clubhouse 1 will host an All-American Barbecue Special Dinner on July 3rd. And the July 4th celebration will be hosted at Clubhouse 2 at 4 p.m. with a DJ, band, and fireworks. Grandparents Fun Day will be hosted on August the 3rd at Clubhouse 2 from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And destination shopping is offered each Tuesday through the Transportation Department. Reservations must and can be made by calling 597-4242. <clears throat> and quoting Beth Perrick, the Recreation Department is doing a wonderful job with the size and the frequency of the events. The PAR 3 hosted a wine and nine, and other events planned to boost utilization. The next event, the wine and nine, is on June, Thursday, June the 6th. The Twilight League will start next month on the last Sunday afternoon of each summer month and continues to sell out. Mr. Sincata spoke regarding the uh, golf course, and he said that usage is back on track at this time. We did uh, discuss and voted to recommend that the emeritus parking pass fee be increased. However, it was not on this month's agenda and will be um, discussed what well, we're waiting for. We wanted to do it all at one time. The emeritus survey, Mr. Gruner, Gruner stated, will be discussed at the uh, July, the next CAC meeting. So we want to do it all as a bundle. 
But uh, the motion was made to approve the staff recommendation to increase the Saddleback Emeritus Institute parking fee to $15, $50 for spring and fall semester and 30 for summer semester for non-residents entering the community. The motion carried 5-3. The other thing for uh, future agendas are the Recreation Department special events. We're looking at the uh, considering revising the rules that may limit the number of reservations a club may have and also the current numerous amount of clubs. So that's something that we're looking at. And the next meeting will be held for CAC in the boardroom on Thursday, July 11th at 1.30, so please attend. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Maintenance and Construction, Director Matson. We did not have a meeting last month, um, so we will be having a meeting this month. It's actually going to be <clears throat> next Wednesday. That, wait a minute, next? Anyway, let me uh, start. Um, what I'm going to, we have uh, 26 items on our project log, and I'm going to discuss a few of them. First one is uh, gates one and gate nine scheduled um, right now to open June the 24th. Next one, gate 10 has been added to the gate um, repair schedule. Next one, community center, first floor renovation project here. It's uh, dealing with furniture, and that's in work. Um, when the security department uh, move into the second floor here, they will um, be having some new uh, furniture, and part of that will be the furniture that's given up on the first floor here. <clears throat> Next one, the um, community center HVAC and controls project, which were, um, our CEO reported a little bit on it, but I'd like to repeat. On uh, May, on, uh, May 11th, 2019, one 90-ton and 275-ton HVAC rooftop units were replaced at the community center building with new energy efficient units. The energy management system controls are currently being installed and will be completed and fully operational by the second week of this month. Contractor will conduct a training session with <coughs> VMS staff on operations and maintenance procedures, as well as training on operating the HVAC system using energy management system controls. A third party HVAC and controls <clears throat> or consultant will commission the new HVAC and control systems and provide a detailed commissioning report. The project is within budget and the remaining on-site work is on schedule to be fully completed by the end of June. Next one, community center flat roof replacement. The flat roof, the flat build-up build roof system is at the end of its serviceable life and will be replaced with a new PVC cool roof. The roofing project at the community center is scheduled to begin on Saturday, June the 8th and completed at, by the end of June. Cool roof systems help reduce what is commonly referred to as heat island effect, which is heat that is absorbed by dark colored materials, which cause air temperatures to rise. Some of the benefit received by installing a cool roof system include lower peak electrical demand and lower energy costs. I got one, also I have the last one here, um, is pack renovation maintenance upgrades at, and at the Performing Arts Center Clubhouse 3. 
A contract was awarded to SVA Architects to begin the development of the construction documents for the maintenance and equipment safety upgrades. Staff received the 90% drawings from SVA and over the next few weeks will review and provide comments to the architect for the final draft. In addition, SVA is preparing material sample boards for the packed interior finishes, which will be included with the architect's project summary presentation at a future PAC task force meeting. And that's all I have. Um, I do have uh, your schedule for, do you want to say anything on the next? Yeah, uh, okay, and then I got energy. And it is next Wednesday. It's not tomorrow, it's next Wednesday. You're right. Right, Wednesday the 12th, next week. Yeah, just in reference to the PAC renovation, um, the, the money that we're talking about that we are going to be working now is behind the stage, the um, riggings, and I don't know all the words for that, but to, to make sure that um, our stage is safe on um, getting up to date on everything we need back there. And then there will be a meeting presenting from the, um, from the design team and that's an unknown date. Thank you. So, so Jim, energy. Okay, Village Energy Task Force. Our next meeting is going to be um, uh, July the 3rd. The energy consultant TEC, T-E-C, has been researching alternative energy systems and conducted a site visit to determine possible site locations. TEC has reviewed load information as well as current backup power sources for the community center, broadband building, and maintenance yard. They were directed by the Energy Task Force to focus their efforts on recommending a micro-grid solution for the community center, Clubhouse 7, and Clubhouse 7 parking load lots. They will be presenting their preliminary findings in early August. And our next meeting for the Energy Task Force will be July the 3rd. That's all I have, Beth. Thank you, thank you. Media and Communications, Joan. I, oh wait, Dick wanted to I say something. I just have one question. I read somewhere where the, uh, pl the preliminary plans for uh, the, um, Clubhouse 3 were available to staff. Are you familiar with that? Say, say that again, that what's available? They, I, I read somewhere, uh, it could have been in the club, I'm not sure, that the plans for Clubhouse 3 are available, or is available to staff. And I was wondering if you had any plans available on the air conditioning. Okay, so that would be a part of the design presentation, but I know that we're working on the uh, air conditioning, which is, which is Actually, air conditioning is separate from what they're doing to update the stage riggings and whatnot. And I don't know, Siobhan, you want to speak to that, the air conditioning? Please let us check and we'll get back to you on the timing and if those are available. Yeah. It, That's, that should be on our MNC meeting next week. Yeah. If it isn't, have Ernesto find out. Yeah. And that well, they it, said that, plans are available. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll research it and we'll find out okay, for you. That's Siobhan will get back with us on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, Joan. The Media and Communications Committee met Monday, May 20th, 2019. Uh, Mr. Holland reminded those of us who are <laughs> handicapped in any way where the they'd be affected by uh, shut off of the electricity to visit the SCE website and subscribe to their alerts. 
we shall try to inform you, continue to inform you in, through the breeze and other means. Uh, Mr. Holland mentioned that after the analog removals, we have increased uh, our reduction, or sorry, we have redu reduced our energy usage by 16%. Um, and you already heard about the proposal to remove Fox uh, sports channels. And that was basically his, his report was uh, very complete about uh, the use, the financials of the, in the first quarter, uh, non-assessment revenues and broadband services employee compensations and so on. And Ms. Pauline uh, Pauline reported that one thing that, that shows uh, MARCOM in action was there was a, a report in the register regarding United's, United Mutual funding and financing, and it was totally inaccurate. And with that, her department took action. The president of United sent a letter of correction to the writer. That letter was copied and sent to two parties quoted in the article. And the president of United submitted a letter to the editor of the Globe correcting the misinformation. And Marcom staff submitted an article to the Globe stating the facts. And it was run in Thursday of May 23rd. Uh, also, Ms. Pollen, uh, mentioned the commercial phone book that most of us are familiar with. It's put out by farmers, I believe, and recommend that it not be uh, take, that it be taken out of central services, primarily because there are many, well, not many, but there are, are mis, there's misinformation in this particular volume. It will still be distributed door to door, and just for your information, but you cannot look, you can no longer get it through central services. Um, that's pretty much highlights of our meeting. And then our next meeting will be Monday, June 17th, 2019, here in the boardroom. And then, Beth, you have a report perhaps from Thrive. I do have a report from Thrive. Um, be sure to watch the Thrive show, 9.30, Thursday mornings, on Village Television. And we have other programs where there's um, interviewing and we continue to have possibilities to interview folks in the village of how they are thriving and how they're enjoying life in this chapter of our life in, here in the village. Scott Marvel and Cindy Whitney are two of our folks that are out there pre presenting programs and having such wonderful ideas for Thrive. One project that is a um, new project that has been, it'll be new to us in the presentation, but it's been being worked on by the video club and the camera club under the leadership of Lucy Parker and Mark Rabinovich. And they are, they are putting together the Centennial Program, Project Centennial. Program. And what is happening with that is they have interviewed, there are over 70 people residing in our village who are over 100 years old. And so they have been contacted and 15 of those folks have been interviewed. We've, we've completed 15 interviews. So we have video interviews and then the camera club under Mark's direction, took photos of the interviewees, today's photo, and then they supplied a photo from maybe high school graduation, something. So we have, uh, this is what I was when I was young, and this is where I am today, and I'm over 100 years old and thriving in this village. So the, it, I think it will be a really interesting project. It's. Um, it's modeled after a project done by, I want to say it's Jan, I think Kruger, not sure if that's exactly the last name, uh, who put out a project similar to this. And we think that this is a, a really good idea and, and it will be presented for the first time, but just, just for the first peek into the project at our 4th of July celebration. 
and the photos will be, the 4th of July celebration is in Clubhouse yeah. 2. And so the photo um, will be, the photos will be in there. And I believe we, we decided we will have the interviews on a loop in there. Might be, hopefully you'll be able to hear because it will be inside. <coughs> anyway, um, we are really excited. The Thrive Group is really excited about this project. I'd like to, since I'm also having a chance to speak about Thrive, let you know that um, if you are interested in participating and working on this team, we would really like to have folks who would come and join us and work on the Thrive Project with us. And so now I have a, how do I have you contact us? Um, Sh Siobhan, if someone were to be interested, could they just take a, bring a postcard or a piece of paper to our front desk and just say, could I hand this in and say, I'm interested in the Thrive Project. This is my name. This is my phone number. And so. Yes, we'll absolutely make that arrangement this afternoon. Okay, that, that would be really good because we could use a few more, um, what do we call them, willing workers. Thank you so much. And that's the report on Thrive. And now we are on mobility and vehicles, Ray. Oh, yes, we met uh, on February the 6th, and there was a lot of controversy going on regarding us spending $46,000 to have a, a transit study uh, outside contract to come in. Uh, the thought was, well, gee, we just talk to the bus drivers and talk to the people who ride the buses and just to the other side people. The committee felt it was necessary to go ahead and have a professional who would be talking to the bus drivers, who would be talking to the riders and the non-riders, and come up with a good study. And by the way, tomorrow afternoon at the meeting uh, here in this, this building at 1.30, uh, Fair and Peers will be giving us a trans, transit study update uh, as to what they have found out and so forth and so on. It is my understanding that they have spoken to the drivers, They've spoken to all kind of folks to get ideas as to what is the best methodology. Uh, like I said, tomorrow afternoon we'll have the next meeting. Um, now we have the Laguna Canyon Foundation. There's a tremendous amount of activities and we have up at the front desk, we have uh, copies of the uh, June activities uh, report, which consists of many, many things. Uh, Wood Canyon Wilderness Park, uh, family hike at the Dilly Park, all kind of things. Now, they're asking that you go ahead and utilize, if you, you must make reservations, by the way, and you should wear shoes, a hat, and bring water and any medication that you need. They want to do that. They also say that you must make a reservation on a lot of these situations. So they do say uh, RSVP online at Laguna Canyon org slash events. Now, many people don't have computers and they can't do that. There is another phone number that can be used only by those folks, please. 949-497-8324. That's 949-497-8324. And like I say, the reports are up the front desk. Good. Thank you, Ray. You and now we have the report of security and community access. Director Tibbetts. Thank you. We did not have a meeting uh, last month, but I would like to bring you up to date on a couple of items. Um, <clears throat> the major incident we had involved a, a man or a gentleman renting from a, an owner, and he created a lot of problems. In fact, he uh, got up on the second floor, had a discussion with the, uh, our CEO, and he misrepresented himself and did a lot, a lot, of, had a lot of problems. Um, when I'm, the main incident, well, I won't get too detail, I'll stay out of that, but however, he is uh, moving out of the community if he hasn't already. And uh, there is the, some damage done he created plus a huge fine and the responsibility of that is the owner, not, not the gentleman. So if you're going to rent out your manor, I would, I would do a background check or something. 
And uh, another incident, well, the next item there would be uh, golf carts. We're getting more golf carts for some reason. Uh, and there are certain rules that people need to follow. Uh, <clears throat> stop signs is the biggest biggest problem with uh, golf cart drivers they don't stop they go right through and uh, also when you have a car behind you you need to pull over just yesterday there was a golf cart uh, with a car behind it and i was behind that car and they is a woman she wouldn't pull over so the car in front of me went around her and almost almost ran into a car parked on the side so just fo follow the rules, that's all. And at this time, I'll ask uh, Director Gross if he would talk on the uh, uh, traffic committee. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, in addition to the people with the uh, golf carts, uh, many of them, believe it or not, go on the side streets, on the regular streets outside. And the rule is that you have to be able to drive 25 miles an hour. They're not supposed to be there, mm -hmm. and uh, they just insist on doing it. In any event, uh, we had uh, 18 people in the morning session uh, and seven in the afternoon session, as well as three letters at the traffic hearings. Just to give you an idea, no parking, we had four. Speed, over and above, 16, one. Stop signs, eight. Uh, contractors uh, parking, we had eight again. And by the way, like I've said many times, there is a notice to contractors and subcontractors it's given out when you hire someone, outside contractors, they should get a copy of this, which they have at the front desk, telling them where they can park and so forth and so on, and people do not uh, do that, they just keep doing it. Anyway, we have driver's license, three people, and here again, some people figure because they're 70, 75 years old, they don't need a driver's license, they do need it. Uh, decal, I'm serious. They come in and say, I'm 75 years old. I only drive in here. Yeah. You must have a driver's license. The decal here again, it was mentioned earlier. There was 11 of them. And here again, registration required. Ex expired registration. We only had two, but last month, uh, the time before, we had eight. And we're putting the word out, you still must register your vehicles. And of the three people that uh, did not show up, well, they submit letters explaining what the circumstances were uh, from what the notices of violation we give them. And, and like I say, we work into all of these things and we have the rules and regulations for the vehicle traffic and parking rules are established. You have them. Please abide by them because it is a real, real challenge. And like I said earlier about the driver's license, it's very imperative that you have a driver's license in here if you're using a vehicle because of the insurance. That is a requirement when you get your driver's license, you must provide insurance. So we wanna make sure our people are safe in here. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have a report from Director Troutman on uh, uh, Disaster preparedness. preparedness. Disaster preparedness, yes. Okay. Uh, there was a meeting on Tuesday, May 28th, um, 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. I, among several others, did not attend because I was sick, but 13 people did attend, one guest and 12 members. Um, Chief Moy clarified to the residents that although residents are not mandated to obtain an RFID, However, they are highly encouraged since the use of the RFID will make it easier and more efficient to enter the gate community by allowing them access to the resident lanes with the RFID reader instead of the guest lane. He also asked the task force um, to consider purchasing small gifts such as keychains that can be used to give residents that attend our disaster preparedness uh, training sessions, such as the good neighbor captain training and uh, CPR AED training. The task force um, considered that, and I'll know more about that in a couple of months. Then the energy committee, I have a report that was sent to me by um, Bert Maldow. He was not there, he was sick as well. 
So some of this might have changed because this report's a week old, but I'll read it and then you can tell me if it's changed. TEC, our consultant, has had difficulty getting the needed electrical load characteristics from Southern California Edison. Both our staff and TEC have fully complied with all of the requirements and paperwork that was required. It has come to the point where we may need to consult council and uh, GRF and also uh, write a letter to the CPUC. They have the data and the lack of um, giving us this data is costing us money. The good news for GRF and the administration building is the proposed legislation in Congress that would provide tax credits for <coughs> microgrids. Micro um, then other committees, there was a good neighbor appreciation uh, barbecue is now planned and we have a date. That's going to be on Tuesday, August 27th, 2019 at Clubhouse 2. So if you are a good neighbor captain or attend the class, which is coming up this week, um, you can qualify to go to that barbecue. You can just call uh, Debbie up in the office, and I apologize, I don't have that number handy, or just call me, and I'll get your reservation for that. Our next meeting is Tuesday the 30th at 2019, 9.30 here in the boardroom. The next class, like I said, tomorrow is CPR, AED, adult CPR. That's at Clubhouse 7 from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Then on Saturday, July 13th, we'll have good neighbor captain training where you might get a whistle for attending. And that's in the PAC in the dining room. That's the Clubhouse 3. That's uh, July 13th between 10 a.m. and 12 noon. And then on Monday, September 16th from 1 to 4, they'll have the basic first aid training at Clubhouse 7. And the October 16th, that's a Wednesday from 1 to 3. They'll have Good Neighbor Captain training again at Clubhouse 7. So uh, look for those dates. Uh, they're supposed to be on the internet every so often. Our webpage, we have a little glitch, but I'm told that they're on there right now. So um, the next meeting will be on July, 20, July 30th. They are the last Tuesdays of odd months. 9.30 here in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Our next safety and security meeting is June 21st in this room. It'll be at 9.30. That's all. Thank you, Don. Um, report of the Landscape Committee, Dr. Maldo. Yeah, we pretty much uh, covered the landscape with the two resolutions we passed today. Uh, I do want to discuss a little bit about the extensive discussion we did have about the creek. Um, we, uh, first of all, made people aware, and anybody that's concerned with the creek, there is a Aliso Creek booklet that is available for anybody that really is interested in the subject and, and wants to delve into the background and information regarding the creek. And that's available at the copy center in the administration building. So if you want to go over there, I don't know what the charge is, but uh, it's supposedly available. Um, Kirk Wyman is just really on top of this whole subject. Um, I've gone down to the Greek now. Um, I, I went down when they did the cuttings. I've been down there recently and saw that it didn't do much good. <laughs> Those willows grow very rapidly. Um, but there's very little that this, we can do today with that creek. He named at least eight agencies that we would have to deal with in order to get any approval, in order to make any changes to the creek. Well, you know, some of the restrictions, for instance, is that if there is a native plant in the creek, we cannot touch it. We cannot remove it. Um, there's just no alternatives that we have other than meeting with these agencies time and time again to try to find out if there is a mitigation plan that we can put into effect. I mean, I myself, I remember when I used to go down to the creek seven, eight years ago, it was very pretty. Uh, the, the reeds are in there now to the point where you can almost, you're not going to see many ducks because they can't get into the creek. So be tolerant, be patient. We know the problem. We're trying to do something about it. And uh, if we need your help, we're going to let you know. Thank you. Uh, the next meeting of the committee is going to be on August the 14th. Thank you, Bert. 
Right. Three of the committee, uh, three of the groups, Laguna Canyon Foundation, Fish and Game Come, uh, and uh, Laguna Canyon, uh, Laguna Woods, yeah. uh, and uh, Laguna Canyon itself. So those are the, you must go through them. Corps of Engineers. And the Corps of Engineers, yeah. <laughs> I just mentioned three of them that I've yeah. been involved in. Yeah. Fish and Wildlife? Fish. Yeah, Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, the, it's the very difficult, <laughs> very difficult. Yeah. Thank you, Bert. Okay, um, no future items. So where we are now is director's comments and I'm going to start with Director Tibbetts. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid that some of our newer residents might be a little confused after some comments were made uh, this morning regarding our name. Uh, our official name is Laguna Woods Village. It was changed a few years ago from Leisure World by a majority vote of the residents. Uh, and we are also a self-governed, self-managed uh, community. And that's all. Good. Thanks, Don. Nothing. 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 No comment. Good meeting. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you. I was just going to say, I saw an article in the paper, a little blurb, that we're having a meeting for people that are interested in being serving on the United Board or the Third Mutual Board, and that um, I know I, for one, am not going to re-up, so I know that we'll at least have one vacancy on the GRF Board, so if people are interested in serving, maybe they could go to that meeting, or at least they could contact one of us, and we'd help them out. Do you know when the meeting is? Does anybody know when that meeting is? It sounds like an interesting one, Siobhan. The meeting of uh, like people interested. I think it's a wine or maybe. Oh, we're yeah. having mixed uh, mixers for the boards, and I will provide the dates at our closed session. I don't have them off today because it didn't mention GRF; it only mentioned the two mutuals. So there will be openings on all of the boards. The three, the two. Uh, yeah, the two housing mutuals and GRF. And so if you're interested, there will be a meeting to kind of catch you up to speed on it. Okay, Ray, thank you. Good meeting, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Judith. Oh, yes. Um, I had the opportunity last week to attend a class at all, on Alzheimer's, but the name of the class was actually How to Talk to Dementia. And I learned some things I really didn't know. And surprisingly, I want to share them with you so um, you can be aware as well. There's a misconception, several falsehoods, that people think if you have Alzheimer's, um, you have dementia. And it's, or if you have dementia, you automatically have Alzheimer's. Well, surprisingly, dementia has an umbrella. There's at least 120 diseases under that umbrella and most of them are irreversible and I want to mention some of them that are irreversible like Alzheimer's is just one of the 120, Lewy body, frontal lobe dementia or something called Pick's disease, vascular stroke, Parkinson's disease is considered a dementia, Huntington's disease and something called CTE. Under the reversible list. I have dementia because I have thyroid disease. If you have thyroid disease, it's considered a dementia, and, but it's reversible with medication. Um, depression is a form of dementia. Drug interactions and infections and some um, nutritional deficiencies are a form of dementia. Uh, something else they brought up that I think we all should be aware of, we communicate with each other quite a bit. And they've done, obviously, since they, the idea of how to communicate with someone with dementia, they did a lot of research on communication. So since we communicate with each other, we communicate with staff, we communicate with the residents, always remember, 55% of your body language is what you're communicating. 38% is your tone of voice, and only 7% is your actual content or words is being communicated. So when you're talking to someone, 
that's why when you text something, they can't feel your emotion, and a lot of times they misunderstand what you're saying. And so that explains why text messages and emails get a little messed up. So when you're talking to someone, remember your tone of voice and remember your body language so that you are effectively communicating what you want to uh, inform the person. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks, if Judith. I that might, was an interesting tidbit. Ray. If I might, because I wear hearing aids, I speak rather loud, and it's unfortunate I can't control it. And some people think I'm rude because of that. So I do try to explain I speak very loud because of the hearing aids. Yes. Yes. Yes, Ray. And that's part of it. Yes, good. Let's good see. Hearing Judith. problems, dementia. <laughs> 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 okay, Pat. Good meeting. No comments. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. I want to thank all of you and your participation and working together as a team. I really appreciate it. And I also want to say to the folks out there in TV land that there are folks sitting here in this audience that are participating and helping us, and they're there. They, they're so knowledgeable, and they, they bring so much to us sitting up here in the dais, and I want to say thank you to, to them. And um, this meeting is now recessed. <laughs>